This is Westside Barbell with strength and conditioning legend, Louis Simmons. Westsidebarbell.com, the strongest website in the world. Welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. Today we're joined with Flavio, our intern, Carlos Cavuero, and Michael Fahey from the Westside vs. the World documentary slash film Louis never wants to do, but it's going ahead. And um, of course, Louis Simmons. Um, today's topic is more of a personal question that I've always wanted to ask. I've been here about five years, not going on six. And Lou, I'm sure amongst everyone else listening, how did this all start? Wh- where, where was the conception of everything with you in weight training? Uh, well, Tom, it was funny. Basically, when I was a little kid, I was little, and I wanted to be a strong man like a lot of guys. You know, unfortunately, throughout the years, I actually became what I wanted to be. I don't think many people can say that. Everybody wants to be a fireman, but they never were. Everybody wants to be a doctor, but they never were. And uh, so I was lucky enough to be in an environment uh, that I, I basically programmed myself to become a, a strong man. And um, I was one for quite a few years, and now I'm old. But it all started basically at, uh, when I was 12 years old. And uh, first I was influenced by reading magazines, Perry Raiders, Iron Man. <clears throat> Iron Man magazine talked about everything. Uh, strong man, um, weightlifting, powerlifting, and bodybuilding and everything. So it had a, it was about everything. It was a nice little magazine until later on it turned into a bodybuilding magazine. And then Bob Hoffman, uh, you know, Bob, a lot of people don't even know who he was. Bob was a father of modern weightlifting. He had uh, York Barbell County before that, um, the York uh, Oil Oil Company oh, where he burned um, uh, stoves. And um, But he started training. He had guys like Bob Benarski and Joe Duby and uh, Bill March, all these famous weightlifters over there that actually worked for Bob. And they would come in supposedly on lunch hour and work up to Max's. But it wasn't, I, I, I'm not so sure they worked there or not. I think he was just paid to be there, to be on the team. And um, so that's how I started reading the magazines and seeing those guys. And uh, so I was influenced. I started weight training at 12. I, I, was, I saved the money. I was a real poor kid. But I saved all the money I could. And then for my birthday, I ended up getting a 110-pound uh, weight set. And I clean jerked 110 at 12 years old. Um, and then, um, so that was the beginning. And um, I just, I had no knowledge. There was no way I never saw how to do a, um, a real clean and jerk until years later in, in, in Iron Man had sequel photos. And I saw where you started clean and, you know, 10 pictures later, how you caught the bar, went to the bottom, got up and jerked it. That's where I first saw it. So, and I had no training partners. And um, so um, that's how it first started out. So uh, I first, in 1966, I graduated from high school barely. But I was immediately going into the army. <clears throat> so um, upon uh, you know, before getting drafted, or at least going to the army in uh, in November, there was a power meeting in Dayton, Ohio, in October 1966. I went over and I met Larry Pacifico, um, George Crawford, Vince Anello, uh, Jerry Bell. Jerry Bell was the first 165 to that at 700, and. Um, and George Crawford was one of the greatest squatters I've ever seen. He basically gave me fundamentals of how to squat, and later on, Larry on the bench, <coughs> and Vince on the deadlift. Uh, they all became, except the exception of Jerry, uh, world uh, IPF world champions. And um, I remember I was over there <coughs> later on at a weigh, and I was weighing in. <coughs> Damn. And um, George showed up, George Crawford, and, and Jerry Bell came in with his little kid. I go, who in the hell is this? They go, oh, oh, man, he'll be something someday. This kid's like six years old. Had a big neck. I thought he probably wrestled. Well, that, that kid was Bobby Wall, and he was in Toledo, Ohio, where they were, and later on he became world champion and world record holder in the 148s. So you never knew who you're talking to, and it taught me uh, instant respect right there. You know, you never knew who you were talking to, um, so learn to respect everybody, on, on uh, even without knowing their merits. But don't you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, secondly, I started to read a book after getting immediately drafted into the Army, uh, Muscle Power Builder. And um, because I was fascinated in this power meet, when I went to the power meet, I got, I was 10th out of 11. I beat a 55-year-old man. And in Olympic weightlifting, I Olympic lifted. At 14, I, in a contest, I cleaned your 240, and I did the 475 with straps. So I Olympic lifted to 18. I went to that power meet. And after lifting there and getting 10th out of 11th, I said, this is my sport. Because I, I trophied every meet I went to in Ohio and uh, against, men, against <coughs> grown men. And, uh, but I said, this is my sport because these guys were built. 
and they had attitudes, and I, I switched immediately. I never looked back to Olympic weightlifting. Do you think, because uh, you said you started attending the block at the age of 12, you were a yeah. block. Do you think <clears throat> that contributed to developing your strength as a former GPP at the start? Yes, known GPP without known GPP, I you know I, I had to uh, carry block. I had, I would go to, at six o'clock in the morning, and the maces would start at seven, and my friend Kenny would would pick me up. He had a driver's license. He'd drive me there, and so we would work for an hour. Uh, you know, mixing the mortar, getting the mortar ready, stocking the scaffold, building the scaffold higher, everything. That's what got me going. Just general work, pushing the mortar in the wheelbarrow. I worked with a mason, and at time. And had to carry from the basement of a where of the of um, an apartment building to the top. It took 540 block. I remember it was like it was yesterday. And I'd start we start in the basement. I carry all the block up. I, I carry two at a time. Never put them down. Two buckets of mortar. Never put them down. That was my mental toughness training. And um, but I'll, I'll never forget. It took 23 shovels of sand for every bag of mortar. There's a lot of things I remember to this day. And that was a long time ago. But it taught me a hell of a lot. And just just discipline. I had to do it. I I was the first one there with Kenny, and we worked an hour extra every day. So I, I learned what hard work is, and the only way I got money was to work for it. No one ever gave me nothing. There was no one to give me anything. So uh, everything I ever had, I worked for. You know, in the gym, your dad can get you a college education, or he can buy you a car, but he can't get you an elite powerless status, or a pro status, or a black belt in jiu-jitsu, or or make a professional rugby team. So you got to do it on your own. So uh, that's what I like about my life. I build a, my own life. Okay, and then that led up uh, when you were twelve. Like when you were a kid, did you realize that you were stronger than most? Like was that that's something that was evident from the start? Yeah, you know it's funny you bring up. I'm glad you're doing, asking these good questions, Tommy, because at uh, in fourteen I had a contest at, at school in uh, intramural class as a clean jerk, and I, I did um, I did one ninety. And this friend of mine weighed 130, he did 180, and we tied on most ever body weight. So then we were going to have a contest a few months later um, at a uh, school carnival. And so it was him and I pitted against each other again. And um, so I remember he did the same weight, 180, and I did 240 at the same body weight, 140 pounds. And I realized then I was cut out to do this sport. Uh, he was not cut out to do this sport. You know, I had this mental driver. There's no way I was going to let his ass kick my ass. There's no way. And, um, yeah, I would, I, you know, just, just general strength. I had enormous general strength for a little kid, not knowing what I was doing. And um, I remember you, you always talk about you used to play baseball mm -hmm. as a kid, and that even there <clears throat> you even excelled somewhat. I, I never played um, baseball till I was 12 years old. And the neighborhood kids, actually the gentleman, I, uh, Harold Rapper, was the person who put me to work when I was 12. Um, and his uh, um, kids, a uh, bunch of kids that lived there with him, played a lot of ball. They were from the city, moved to the country where I lived, and so they got me to play baseball. I played little league one year. I hit 17 home runs. It was the most in, in Columbus, Ohio, for any league. And I remember right down the street a mile away. We live here at Valley View, as you well know, Tom. Um, I would hit home runs, and this changed my life dramatically. I'm sure, Carlos, maybe something like this happened to you in fighting. Um, I would have hit a home run, have to run around the bases like a madman, and make sure I get there before they threw me out. Well, down the street here at Valley View, there's a fence. It was the first place I played with a fence. I hit the ball over the fence and actually got a trot around the bases, and everybody yelled my name. And I, I thought to myself, I can be something. And that changed me right there. It made me know I could be something. I didn't give a fuck what anyone else thought about me, and I still don't. And uh, uh, But it made me think I could be something, and it, it started me on the road to where I tried to go. How old were you at that time? I was 12 years old. Yeah. How about fighting? I mean, in the early, uh, <clears throat> it seems that you, your your mental toughness and your strength, it could lead you to a powerlifting as much as could lead you to a, a fighting or like martial arts, and you never touched that water. I mean, There was no water to touch. You got in a lot of fights. I mean, at 13, I got a fracture skull. Guy hit me in the head with a baseball in his hand. Um, by 18, I had a broken jaw and a broken, a broken hand, got a pin in it. And I love to fight, but I didn't know how like anybody else. Now, you know, now, with, with, because of the UFC and Bellator and everything and Pride, a lot of people got some kind of background in something. Back then, there was no such thing. You was lucky to get to a boxing gym. Uh, there's one down here, but it was like three miles away. I didn't have a car, so I couldn't even go to the boxing gym. So that's that's how it was. But I got in a lot of fi fights on the street, down the street called the Bottoms. Um, my A lot of kids that I knew were a lot older than me, and they would take me, uh, they would take me down there. 
and invariably get me in a fight. <laughs> and I mean, it was it was scary because everybody was always bigger. I was a little kid, 140, and um, you know I was 13, 14 when this was going on. And then uh, so I was always scared, but I was also scared to lose. I didn't want to lose in front of these these kids as in sophomores and juniors and and um, seniors in high school. One of them was named Jimmy Scanlon, and because we didn't have any money. So we'd play a, a game where if you, you had to hit a ball inside the yard and get to second and score a run. And it was a you against the outfielder, and the pitcher was neutral. And I remember Jimmy's probably a 220-pound high school senior, and I remember I hit a ball and slid into second, and Jimmy and Jimmy says, you're out. And I stood up and said, I'm safe. And Jimmy slapped me in the face as hard as he could. He said, you're out. I was out. That's how I grew up, picking order. I couldn't kick his ass. He turned 20 pounds. But that's how I grew up. And I... And I think that's what's wrong with America. No one sla gets slapped in the face anymore. There's no pecking order. They all think they're equal. They're not. <laughs> in a dark alley, you'll find out someday. Someone's grabbing your girlfriend's ass, and some guy across the street's got to go and protect her. You'll find out what kind of a man you aren't. I agree. Yeah. Wise words. That brings us 13, 14. Oh, so, um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I, I'm just seeing, I'm trying to lead up to before you went into the Army. Mm. Um, how was your training up to that? Like, was it as rudimentary as you can get back then? Uh, yeah, it was, it was like, had no idea. Like, I mean, zero idea what I was doing. And um, I, I remember my dad got me some, he worked in a, um, a machinist at the time. He got me some plates. So the lightest weight we're going to bar was 170 pounds. So I loaded that up and I got a pair of squat racks and tried to squat and went straight to the bomb belt, got killed. And I would, um, I would try to squat or deadlift, and um, I think, uh, you know, uh, all my, uh, uh, my uh, pubic hairs were getting pulled out, but what I was doing, I was getting tears, you know, I, was, I was getting minor hernias. So I'd rest a few weeks or two and go right back to it. I didn't know any difference, you know. I didn't go say, hey, hey Dad, my, you know, my balls are hurting, so go right back to it. And uh, that's, that's how I grew up with absolutely no knowledge other than reading Iron Man and uh, Strength and Health and so forth. And I'd imagine that's why even to today, you find it so important to put in good quality photos, and because you you made a, you made sure you did that in your your new book, the Olympic lifting book, and um, the explosive power and jumping, to uh, because photos play such a huge part in your training growing up, and that's one thing that's really not in any strength training book nowadays. Right. Yeah. There's exercises you people don't even know what they are that we use only constant constantly, and they don't even know what they are. All right. So. Uh, Hmm. What? I was gonna say well, we're up to where you're 18 and okay. Well, yeah. When I got drafted, I uh, I got drafted in the infantry. Of course, Vietnam War is going on, so I know I'm going to go go to Vietnam. Um, and uh, what happened was I went to infantry school, went to uh, Germany. When I got there, <clears throat> I started reading Muscle Power Builder, and um, uh, in that book, um, there was always been a powerlifting section by the old the original Westside Barbell Club in Culver City, California. Uh, Bill West. Um, uh, Pat Casey, George Friend, those are the main guys, and uh, Bill Thomer and these guys. And it, it's funny, you know, because in my gym, as you well know, Tom, if you want a picture of my gym of yourself, you get famous and you die. So as, if that you want a picture, get famous, die, I'll put your picture up. But you better <coughs> give me the frame first. <laughs> and um, But that's where I learned how to lift. Um, they were a total inspiration to me to this day. Uh, because that's why my gym is called Westside Barbell. You know, they died. I trademarked it, United States trademark in 1986 or 7. And I did it out of uh, dedication to these men because they were years ahead of everybody else. Just years. Uh, There's Weeder Magazine, and he had all kinds of Weeder, the Weeder principles, you know, crazy as hell. But really, a lot of them were as crazy as you sound. And um, Friend and all the guys were doing all kinds of great things. So that's, that's basically how I, I got my start. Um, with any, any the mildest sophistication of training, uh, still linear periodization, which you know, Tom's a total waste. Um, and then, uh, then I finally got out of the army, <clears throat> and I started lifting full time in 1970. Um, so I'm going to meets. I mean, there's world champions uh, every which well, well, one world champions in 1970 till 1972. But I mean, the strongest Ohio is a freak of a straight for strength. But you know, I talked to Larry Pacific about bench. He said, Lou. He told me it's funny because I squatted uh, in '71. I won my I was I got my first national championship trophy in 1971 in Patterson, uh, um, New Jersey, and I squatted the national squat record there. And Larry told me it was a hell of a uh, thing. He said I had one of the best squat techniques he'd ever seen at that time. There's no gear, zero gear, wrong guys. Uh, two R wins, no belt, no gear, no nothing. That's that's wrong. And um, 
But uh, so he told me, but if I never learned how to bench, I would never win, win in nationals. I got third in that meet. And, you know, it's, it's funny as it turned out because it took, it took uh, 10 years for me to make a top 10 bench. Squat and deadlift was a joke. I could make it in my first meets. Um, so I was, I was doing that, but it took me till 1980 to make my top 10 bench. But Larry said triceps was three quarters of my bench. Well, my first experience with what Larry told me, I'd go home and try, work my tries. So I'd leave and meet with Larry back. My bench would go backwards. I go, what the hell, you know? But I was so far out of shape, like a lot of guys today, I went backwards for a while. And I would abandon, go to me and get my big five pounds. Larry goes, have me working your arms, have you? I could tell they're no bigger. I'm like, oh, fuck you, Larry. And, but he was right. So I'd go back and do some tries, and then I'd go backwards. And then, but one time, uh, me got cast. I got a notification in the mail. And there was no emails, of course, back then or telephones or anything, you know. And um, so I get a, a note in the mail that the meet was canceled. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to trade my tries, as Larry said. So my next meet, I made a 20-pound PR. I was making five-pound PRs. And it's funny because I, went, I benched a massive 340 at about 172 pounds, and I was in Indiana to meet. And Bill, a man called Bill Cena was there. He traded for Ernie France, who's a famous guy, the godfather of powerlifting. And um, but I go, Bill, can I ask you a question? This Bill uh, was 250 pounds of muscle, and he won six best chess awards when he had such a thing in Mr. America's. And I go, Bill, can you give me some tips on benching? Man, this guy had the beatiest size I'd ever seen. He grabbed my arm and my shoulder, and I thought for sure he was going to kill me. And he's jerking me around and everything. And he goes, you need to bench illegal. So he goes, go outside the rings an inch. Do sixes when you can't make progress. Jump, Start over with eights. If you can't make, go to tens. Go back to sixes. So, okay, what the hell? So then as the meet goes on, I watch him go out there and bench, bench close grip. And I'd seen a man at 45 years old bench 545 to meet in a t-shirt at 242. So but I watch him bench close grip, and I'm going, hey, wait a minute, dude. What, is he playing me or what, what's up? So I went back, and I started doing what he did. And uh, it took my bench between the ultra-wides. I had a 340 bench at that meet, and that was in 1972. 1997, I touched and go 500 roll at 197. So it took my bench eventually to 515. I'm not very big, and I realized that's as big as I should have got. My bench wasn't going bigger. And um, so I, you know, I was about 202 pounds when I did that. And, uh, but between these two men, using two systems, it took my bench from 340 roll to 515. And uh, we'll talk about years later what I did, uh, you know, because I was an average bencher. I get on my guys because I can't bench, and I was average. My, my, tons of guys better than me in the gym. Um. I had a, going back to the Culver City, West Side Barbo, and the influence they had, when when did um, you go from regular squat to the introduction of the box squat? Uh, actually, around 1967, Tom. As soon as I was drafted, I got drafted in 66, and soon after the the you know the next year, I am reading about box squats. I, mean, I had a 410 squat. I Olympic lift, like I said, at 14. I squatted 410 at 14 with no formal training. I, but at 19, I had a 410 squat. So... I read this about box squat. I said, I got nothing to lose. So I box squat for three months, took a regular squat, and did 450. And then, then three more months later, I did 500. And actually, right off the bat, with no gear at all, I did 630 in the contest uh, at 180 pounds. There's no gear. Uh, and two hour wins, you weighed less after me than you weighed in, unlike today where you weigh 20 more pounds. So that's where I got my start on the box squats. I mean, no one's ever going to tell me it don't work. Well, we had the last, the two greatest squatters in the world, Chuck Vogelbull, pound for pound, 1180 at 264, and then Dave Hoff, um, uh, 1210 at 271, are box squatters. Laura Phelps, the greatest female squatter of all time, 775 and 165, 672 at 148. Um, uh, and uh, what is she, a box squatter? All of our girls are box squatters. We, at, I'll just give you the girls. I don't have time to talk about the guys. At 123, our record is 530, world record total, Natalie Carr. Um, at 132, um, it's 540. Uh, Amy Weisberger, 10 times body weight. Amy squatted 590 at 48. Then Laura Phelps ended up doing 672. Laura did 775. These are all world totals, uh, record holders, <coughs> too, as well, from 23 to 81. And then Laura squatted 775 and 65 and 770 81. They're all box squatters. I mean, I would have the weakest gym in the world, not the strongest in a squat if they didn't work. It also puts your deadlift up enormously. <coughs> So, uh, in talking to uh, Larry Pacifico, he he said to us that uh, back then in the in the early '70s that people didn't realize that um, within the sport everyone was still kind of figuring out 
uh, the form of the squat, not just the box squat, but the actual competition free squat. And he said that you were one of the guys who kind of shaped, uh, you know, the sort of style within that that time period. Are you? Uh, you kind of figured some things out that were a little ahead. Well, I talk about this, but I, <laughs> you know, I talk about the Bridges Flare. And Larry was squatting wide. I squatted wide. Um, many guys, uh, Joe Weinstein squatted wide. Um, the big super heavy we were talking about. Him. Don Reinhardt. Don Reinhardt squatted wide. I don't understand why people think we're all squatters squat close. But but anyhow, Mike Bridges was such a fun phenom that they called it the Bridges Flare. And because, you know, and I guess they should have because he's a phenomenal squatter. But Larry had some of the best form I've ever seen. Um, and Larry did some of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. I believe he may be the greatest powerlifter competitively that ever lived. There are stronger powerlifters. I've got one, Dave Hoff. No one can touch him. He, he'll, he'll win in a warm-up room without going on a platform. Um, Sean Frankel, Eddie Cohen physically may be the strongest, and Mike Bridges uh, second physically strongest in impeccable form. But they were so strong that no one could match them. It, no, there was no there was no mental game to it. Um, Larry beat me 100 pounds at 98. And 100 pounds in 220s, and uh, you know that that don't sound like a lot, but it's a lot when you know you don't have you can't put a bench shirt on, and, and gain 75 pounds overnight, you know, with a new bench shirt. So I and he won nine straight world championships, and actually going ahead a few years in 1980, because I won my first nationals in 1980 where I got my top 10 bench I was talking about, and then Larry was injured like he was starting to get hurt a lot, and he uh, in, the, in the deadlift he took a five pound jump on the second. Which you do, you notify your third, and that's what he did. And he couldn't take a third; he lost. That's how his uh, championship reign ended. Just a technical s mistake, so that they caught at the scores table, and he couldn't continue. Which uh, <clears throat> you said to me a while back that George Crawford was one of the guys that you kind of looked up to someone at the squat at the start, and that he taught you. Yep, George Crawford uh, is a tremendous squatter. He squatted around 650 pounds of no gear, 165. And everyone at 500 was a huge squat at 165. He was a man for you to do that. So uh, George, uh, I would call George, and George was a pretty crazy person. And, but uh, George told me one thing, and what do we preach in the gym? If you, you have to start out right to end right. So if you start out wrong, you'll never make a good squat. And so I always followed that advice. And, uh, you know, talk about George. I mean, poor George is dead now, but he's a, just a great guy. And I would call his house and... You know, I'd always make maybe one call a month. It's nothing like what you see today, you know. People's on their freaking phones every second. You know my phone, Tom. It's got nine numbers. <laughs> and I can't remember them. Eight of them's the same number, so it doesn't matter. But um, it, uh, I called George's house, and I and the phone rang, and the guy picks up, and I says, is George there? And no one says anything. And I says, is George there? And he goes, no, but I'm his connection to Earth. <laughs> I said, well, when George gets back, have him call me, will you? So I talked to George about a week later. That's the kind of conversation that he was a real, real crazy guy. But it's a true story. Um, and, you know, like Larry in the bench about the triceps and then Bill Cino. See, I used to think. And Tom, now we've, we've got uh, Wes um, uh, McCormick. Wes came here to top uh, 165 in the country 885 eight months ago. 888 eight months ago. He just, he's done 2000, 2005 already. But we, he took his bench from 515 to 580 by doing the very same program I did. Of how many years ago? 40 or 50? What is it? 50 years ago? <laughs> 1970? Yeah, 46. 40, 44 years ago. Yeah. So, guys, there's new stuff and there's old stuff, but, you know, sometimes the old girlfriend's better than the new girlfriend's to think about training like that, too. That's one thing you always bring up. Man. I know we are, we live in an age where we can talk to each other as quick as we can, but... Back then, for you, it was vital to get information at powerlifting meetings, and that's how you learned. You go back and try it. I think a problem now is that people have access to too much information, and they try too much rather than what you have to do. You got to try something. It either worked. You came back to the meet. You tried something else. You came back. At least you gave it a chance to see if it worked or not. Nah, there's too much bad information out there now. Everybody's got information. Was it any good? That's the thing. It's no good. So you got to be careful what you listen. You know, the thing is, people give up on programs too much. In Powerlifting USA, I wrote articles for years and years for them. Every month there was a workout of the month. So I knew people every month, they'd switch the workout and do a new workout. I mean, it made no sense, but that's what they did. Um, you know, going back to uh, getting tips, and in the deadlift, Vincentello. Um, I was at a meet in early 70s events, and I remember my list, but I won outstanding lifter, you know, in the first session, 98 down. 
And they went over and, and Vince had pulled 700 deadlift in this meet at 198. I was in 81. And they go, hey, Vince, Simmons won outstanding lifter. And I'm sitting right next to him. And he goes, and you, you need 780 to win outstanding lifter. Well, the world record was 760 by Ed Matz. And Vince goes, okay, give it to me, just like it's another day. And the guy went over, you know, and there was no round system. So an hour later, if I got to up here, he pulled the 780 and beat me. I'll never forget this. <laughs> You know, just walk up and you tell a guy he needs 780, 20 over the world record, and he just done seven, and he goes over and pulls it and beat me. Not that that was a big deal, but there was, that was a big deal to, to, to see that man do that mentally. Deadlifters are all mental. Tommy we went to neither living, living deadlift. I told you these are all weirdos. Well, what, what was there? Weirdos. All weirdos. That's why they're so damn strong. You mentioned four things there in the past right now. There was details that change everything. Is that part of lifting? Always lay on the details. A lot of people are late because they don't read. I read all the time and I experiment all the time, but they don't. Like changing a grip will change you. Like we we're, we're, were in the gym the other day. He was just like, you know, he was never pulling up a 500 and then he changed a little bit of the angle what he was looking at and then that goes that 500. Mm -hmm. So he would, I mean, I don't know how, you know, that detail of where you're looking, where you grip, how, you, how you're going to, you know, put your hand where you're going to put your foot. Is always that going to be a detail for powerlifting? Or? It's always a detail because no one's built the same. And the smart people in my gym, I'll get into later what I think I learned because um, I taught everyone in my gym, but then I learned from them. You know, a lot of people taught me a lot, but I didn't teach them anything. And they perished. And that's the key. When you learn, when you stop learning, you, you're, you're done. So... Um, we learn every day. That's all we do. It's, my gym is not an experiment. It's a private gym. And, you know, it's not that big anymore. It's, what, maybe 15 lifters. I pay for everything. Probably cost me thirty five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. But it's my experimental lab, and that's all it is. And I need that lab. If you don't experiment, I, you know, if you're afraid to experiment, you won't get any better. Um, you know, talking and speaking of Vince, too, um, right after that, I met Vince at another meet. <clears throat> I mean, he went on a deadlift 821 at 198. So this is what kind of a deadlift he was. But I, I said, Vince, what makes your deadlift go up? And he looked at me, you know, and he's a hell of a nice guy. And he goes, anything makes my deadlift go up. And he basically walked off. I go, like, what, a, what an asshole. And, uh, but then I got to thinking about it because I was doing the conjugates as far as ever such, you know, didn't know it. And he was, everything made his deadlift go up. It's exactly what he said. So um, it's really weird how he said it. And I apologize later on, you know. I apologize to magazines many, many times because I don't get to see Vince. I haven't seen him for years now. But, I mean, it was a big thing for me. Everything makes your deadlift go up. If you don't try something new, you, you know, you're stuck. So um, it's funny. A guy called Bill Starr as well wrote, a, wrote an article. It's basically called, um, he wrote a book, The Strongest South Survive, and a couple more. He wrote a, an article. Um, it, it's basically, uh, if you want to deadlift, don't deadlift. So he, Olympic lifting, he was a national champion in weightlifting and powerlifting in one year. And so what he wanted you to do was power clean at the time. I did that. So power clean, good mornings, rack pulls, all these things we don't do regular deadlifts. I did it and took my deadlift from 525 to 670 and um, from halfway through 71 to February 73. And I mean, official, and just missed 700. So it, I did exactly, you know, what uh, Vince, it's, it's a conjugate system. You know, that was never brought about until, um, you know, 1972 at the Dynamo Club. He had 70 high qualified weightlifters and Furfashansky and Medvedez was part of it. Um, they picked up uh, 20 to 45 exercises, and at the end of the experiment, um, one guy said, uh, 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 the one guy said, yeah, that's good, and the rest wanted more exercises. So it had a name. Of course, the Russian put a name on everything, you know. But if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys right now. Um, so, um, but basically, that's, you know, that's how I, I did it, out of articles and um, competing and talking to great lifters. Tony Fratto, I broke his uh, national squat record, and I met Tony, I, and he wasn't there, and um, he's a junior national record holder the year before, and I met Tony in, in Cincinnati, he talked about how big my traps were when I actually had them, and um, so uh, it, it's funny, but I, I broke his record, but he, he always told me a lot of things, and he's a tremendous squatter, world record holder many, many times over, and uh, he told me, if you ever get hurt, like he tore a groin, he said, if you tear a groin, and you get up to the same point, you'll tear it again, and that's absolutely true with people. And that's why I tell people nowadays, wear gear. I don't know a sport in the planet that you don't wear a mouthpiece or a, a helmet or, or tape your ankles or something. So I don't get why no gear because you got, after a while, you got two choices when you stall. You got to gain weight or you got to lose weight. 
But the choice is you're going to get hurt. And, and, or the only way you will get hurt if you suck. Because you ever watch a, a horse race? Horses come in last and never get hurt. It's the front runners that get hurt, not the ones that come in last. Um, you know, I mean, uh, um, you got more questions, Tom? Um, what a, back then, was that the era of, you got Larry Pacifico, obviously, but when the Mike Bridges, was he early 70s or was he late? Mike Bridges, I first met Mike. Uh, I'd never heard of Mike Bridges. In the 1977 Junior Nationals in Nebraska, I'm lifting out there. I'd been hurt and finally got back. And this little kid comes up to me wearing a jacket with all these patches. Like, hey, my, I'm Mike Bridges. Are you Louis Simmons? I said, yeah, I'm Louis Simmons. Because uh, people knew who I was, you know. But I was good and hurt, good and hurt. Didn't know what the hell I was doing. And he goes, I'm going to break the world record on the bench today. So I'm looking at him. And I'm, I'm thinking, who in the hell's coat is he wearing? And 80 patches on it. <laughs> little blonde-haired kid, and he's 148 in high school. And I go, okay, good luck, Mike. And then I noticed, I watched him. He lifted on the first day, and he benched 385 world record. As a high school senior. <laughs> And that was his first world record. And then he went on a rampage. It's like no other rampage I'd ever seen. So, um, but, uh, so and I would talk to Mike. Mike would, uh, he'd tell me some stuff. And I said, Mike, you ain't that smart. I said, you're just strong as hell. And uh, I went home and tried. He told me, he's the first guy ever told me to assume my dad to drive my feet out and pull back, not up. So I went and did it. And I'll be damned. Uh, my dad immediately took off. And uh, you squat, he said, a, a squat, a, 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 um, the only difference between a squat and a deadlift was um, he thought a squat was a uh, arch back good morning to parallel. And that's pretty much how I describe it years ago before gear where they are straighter up now. But he also said a deadlift is nothing but a squat with a bar in your hands. And he's very, very, he's right on target, man. I watched this guy at 180, bench 529 in a t-shirt. He walked out, squatted 843, and a, something you wouldn't even wear, your girlfriend wouldn't wear it to bed. And uh, that's how thin it was. And uh, no, you know, no bench or any pulled 771 deadlift. This is one hellaciously strong person. And he started having some health problems, had to drop out way too early. He's a sensational lifter. I remember, I think he totaled 2105 in a meet with Eddie one time in, Eddie, in Eddie's beginning career. Eddie did like 2000, 2000, just to give you an idea. But in my opinion, at 98 down, Mike would have <coughs> won. Mike was the strongest person I've ever seen, 198 down. He was a little too small to compete with Eddie, 198 up. He was very, you know, probably five foot one or something. I don't know, he's not very big. And Lamar Gantby at this time, too? Yeah, Lamar, I mean, a uh, uh, guy called me up, like I said, phone call now and again, a guy calls me up from Michigan. So the man, I got this kid, if he's 14 years old, he deadlifts 500, and he weighs 114. I'm going to, yeah, sure. Well, sure enough, it was Lamar Gant. They wouldn't let him in the first world, if I recall, because he's too young. And, uh, I mean, he might be 13 years old. I think he had to be 14 to compete. And lo and behold, uh, this guy shows up on the scene, deadlifting over 500 pounds, like 15 years old, at 114. I watched him. Um, I've seen one standing ovation at a power meet. A precious McKenzie was from Great Britain was over here, and he did a 556 in the one in the 123s to um, top out the biggest total to meet the world championships in Dayton, Ohio. Well, um, Lamar had to pull 622 um, to, and that was I tied the world record 556. Lamar needed 622 to win the meet, and he goes out and pulls the freaking thing. And I mean, I've never seen a standing ovation of Power Me, and they gave him one. The guy was the greatest gentleman. I think he won something like eight, 17, 18 world championships. He was the only person that I know of in the IPF where they held the, the, the deadlift record and the bench record. And uh, But he ended up dead in 683 at 132. So this is a monster of a little guy. And just one of the greatest gentlemen I ever met. Had a, a lot of people, you know, come to my house. Uh, Dave Waddington, the first 1,000 pound squatter. I watched Dave total 1,500. You know, in 1972, and uh, I'll, I'll get back to that story. But then he come to my house. We talk about training, and and um, Danny Wilbur, the first 900 deadlifter. I'm going to meet with Danny, and he he's uh, 16 years old. And this guy goes, hey, this guy's going to be real strong. So I look at a little fat guy. And I go, oh, okay. Well, I pulled 710 in that meet at 195, and Danny pulled 670. He's 16 years old, 198. Next year, 755 at uh, 220. <coughs> And next year, he pulled 804 at 242, uh, tw and then goes on to be the first 900-pound deadlifter. So I've had all these tremendous experiences. You know, the good friends of mine back then. Come from Black Shelf World, one of the strongest gyms it was. And um, Joe Joe White, Bill Kazmaier, uh, I mean, Jim Williams. I, I went in this 1971, I, I got my first, I got third place in the first nationals. I walk out, I see this big black guy. I mean, it's like he is taking up the whole door, and it was like a garage door. And I go, what the hell is this? And it was, um, 
it was Jim Williams. I mean, his his delts look like bowling balls. Man, he'd been 675 in the first Worlds 1972 in, in a T-shirt. I mean, it took years for anyone to finally break that record. And uh, it's just a mon And also, I watched him in Cincinnati. People don't know, but he squatted, I know, 860 for world record squat as far as the records were going at the time, the most ever. And, and uh, so he was an all-around good lifter. His deadlift wasn't so good. He trained uh, John Cook. He trained with John Cook, who was really a, a strange, uh, demented-looking person. And, um, I mean, he was this crazy strong. He also could bench six, um, was built to deadlift. And, and they used a program. It's 19 to 20. He did heavy bodybuilding uh, almost all year. And then uh, three weeks before meet, they did 19 to 21 reps in the workout. And, like, Williams would bench 600 pounds every other day four or five times. Every other day. And that's how he did it. Then he would take a week off and go to meet. So there's all kind of programs out there for certain kind of people. Um, and, um, in correlation to where we're up to, we're up to like what the <clears throat> mid seventies. Mid seventies, uh, yep. Had were you still training on your own, or had you introduced a training partner at this time? I I didn't get a training partner in 1976. <laughs> yeah, you know. Meanwhile, I watched John Cole total 2370, uh, 286 pounds of no gear at all, um, and um, he was from um, um, Scottsdale, Arizona. Is one of the most amazingly strong people I've ever seen. 885 deadlift. Jack Barnes uh, ruled the squad in my weight class. I think he did 710 with no gear. 148, just a, a monster. And, you know, I noticed there was always someone new on the platform. Every time I'd go to meet you, there'd be some new guy show up. But uh, a lot of these guys, I've always said the brightest stars burn out the fastest. And sure enough, you know, people, there's 100 people on the cover of PLUSA that people <coughs> don't know who they are because they just burn out just as fast as they showed up. What were the person? Uh, it seemed like there was a lot of different personalities back then. Like you had people who were very introverted or extremely extroverted. Compared to today, like I looked through, we got um, all the photos that you showed me, and you can see just first of all the difference in body types. Everyone back then, their joints were so much thicker. That's the biggest difference I can. And their necks, like the necks, the joints, everything is so much bigger. But um, you see people in dressing gowns. See people wearing sunglasses in the back. You just see all these different personalities. And um, could you touch on that a bit? Just uh, how much that, that played into it, like enjoyable, like going to a meet, seeing all these different things. Yeah, there was a lot of crazy people out there. I mean, Vince, you know, he put towels over his head and, and sheets, and, you know, you couldn't talk to him. When I pulled 710, where I talked about Danny pulling 670, there was at least uh, six, 198 pulled 675 in that meet. And I'm sitting beside one crying his eyes out the whole damn time. He's crying his eyes out. That's how he's psyched up. I was a few guys down in Texas. Uh, it actually did the same thing. It would cry before they did live. I got very inwardly emotional, rocked back and forth. I, I put everything just, I was very controlled emotional. Um, one of the craziest guys I've ever known, his name was Back to Whack, Joe Spack. He was an accountant. And I mean, you know, uh, he was just uh, out there in left field. He'd go, he'd always come in a suit wearing tennis shoes. No one wore tennis shoes in the 1970s with a suit on. And I can tell you, uh, I'll tell you two little stories. Because he bumped me in the third. I thought I got second place wrapped up. And he comes out, takes a 650 deadlift at this uh, meet in New Jersey. And he walks up, he wears glasses, freaking glasses fall off his face. He takes them and throws them in the audience 75 feet. And he managed to pull 650 and knock me in the third. But uh, he was telling me a story about SPAC one time and... Uh, He's in uh, Miami, Florida at a gym downtown on the corner of a major, uh, you know, major high street and broad street type of thing. And they say he goes, he loads up a bar and he, he goes outside and he screams and runs in and grabs and deadlifts it. So he loads up some more weight and he goes outside, he's out there for 10 minutes, starts screaming, runs in, deadlifts it. It was on, on, on. And then they said, so he loads up another weight and he goes outside and they're waiting and waiting and waiting and he don't come in. So he went outside, he's in a police cruiser, they arrested him. We're <laughs> <laughs> running down the street, running in the gym. So uh, he was just uh, total, that's why we call him Spack the Whack. You know, a lot of guys like that. And uh, like Tom, you know, you said you, you talked, you, you got to talk to some deadlifters yeah. and they're very, they're very, very different. Uh, very, most, uh, most of them are very introverted. Yeah. J.M. Blakely was a big bencher by Jim. He was just like a deadlifter. Right, 700 on his forehead, carry a rock mount with 700 on it. I mean, do the craziest things I've ever seen, but that was him, you know. I don't care what it takes, as long as you succeed. One of the most impressive people is uh, Tom Eisman. You look at him, and I'm like, this is just like an average guy. And then he's up there, what the, open up with like six, 700 pounds. Right. And you think, like, there's no way this man could do it. Pulled 780, 181. 
And I asked him one time, I always ask people, said, where do you feel the deadlift? He trained, he come here and trained at my gym and just did some big band stuff. And uh, I said, where do you train deadlift? And he stares for a half hour and he goes, everywhere. And that makes sense. You shouldn't feel the deadlift any particular way. You should feel it all over your body. That way your whole body is doing the lift. And I, I thought that was pretty profound, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, and he was always experimenting with different things. Who was the lifter that you asked him about the abs? That story. Uh, Jesse Jackson, and, and not the one that we know of. <laughs> it's always in the public eye. Yeah, I was at a meeting. I had a young lifter with me, and Jesse had abs like Mr. America. And I walked up, and I said, Jesse, uh, he was in Texas with uh, Larry Minstress and a bunch of real strong guys at the time. He ha don't have any anymore, it seemed like. But they, I walked up and said, man, how did you get those abs? And he just stares at me. And and so uh, I asked him again, after like 30 seconds, how'd you get those abs? And he, he looks at me and he goes, abs? And he never says another word. So we left. And that's the kind of people that I, you know, come up with just very strange, out, out to lunch kind of people. But if you show me an ordinary man, he'll lift ordinary weights. I don't need ordinary weights. I need extraordinary weights. So I, I, I go after the people that are out. You know, a lot of them don't last long. They're self-destructive, but I don't care. Some guy was saying the other day to one of my lifters might not be doing so well for himself. He gets help from the family. I don't care. I only care what you do in my gym. You could be Charles Manson outside my gym. I don't care. I don't care what you do outside my gym. You come to my gym, break records, that's all I care about. You make my gym stronger. Westside Barbell is a living thing. It's always going to go. You know, there's three temples. Shaolin Temple, the Lucha Temple, and Westside Barbell is a temple of power. And that's why I see it, three temples. So that's why I like to keep it. Hey, my best time in West Sidebar Bell is my last day before competition because I know I don't have to come in here. God, that's a hell, man. <laughs> you were so work. happy that day. You're, oh, he's so singing happy. and dancing. The last day you have to come out before your camp's finish, as your last day of hard workout, before that you have a week before your fight, that's the perfect time, man. That's the, my happy time. I've never been so happy inside a barbell before. Yeah, we're Is glad to see you go. And uh, when? And now, yeah, and now we're coming back again. That's the test. You know, when you're leaving home, you'll be like, oh, man, where are you going? I was like, oh, I'm going west side barbell, man. Why are you so sad about that? Like, well, because you don't know what's about to happen in there, man. That's a walking in the hell, dude. So. And, uh, and you love the place, right? I love it. Have you ever got kicked out of West Side Barbell? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm part of Barbell. That's right. right? Why did you get kicked out? If you never get kicked out of Barbell, you're not part of Barbell. <laughs> yes, you know what I mean? Come on, dude. Uh, he's on Brazilian time all the time, folks. That's what the hell's wrong with um, him. I'd like to touch on a little bit on Black's Health World. Uh, are you going to talk about them later? Or? I can talk about it right now. Because um, from you and then go up to Marcus's place and then talk to them, they seemed like... Westside has its own reputation, its own story. But my God, these guys had story after stories after stories. And I wonder if you could touch on some of the ones that are somewhat public. You could <laughs> something like you kind of talk about. Yeah. Uh, well, just to start out, mild, they'd all go to the meet, and I guess a lot of them are, uh, you know, Italian Catholics. You know, so they go there and get a big circle and they'd pray. And as soon as they let their hands go. Uh, they'd be asking Bob, when do I take it? When do I do this? When do I do that? Then they get a big fight. I don't care. I don't care, Jack. I'm, you can kick my ass when I don't care. You know what I tell you. It'd be a, almost a near riot. I was at a meet with them. I actually lived with them a few times. I, I lived to, you know, We didn't have a team. And we're lifting in Sandusky, Ohio, and I'm getting ready to pull uh, my first 700-pound deadlift. So first, Tony Fratto, they turn his deadlift down. And he comes back in the back, and he deadlifts. There's 495 on the bar sitting next to me. I'm just sitting back there trying to be calm. You mother, and he's cussing, and does 10 reps, slamming and cussing, begging someone to come in the back and kick their ass. And um, so next up, Jack Sedaris, 675 deadlift, same thing, turns it down. I hear Jack out there going crazy. He walks up to every referee, called him a, a, a God, yeah, you, say you can call him a, he says, you're a motherfucker, called all three referees, then takes his belt off, slams the floor, and knocks a brand new gym floor, big hunk out of the floor. So meanwhile, this is the last we ever lifted there. We're banned for life. And then Steve Wilson, a monster of a guy, um, uh, just tremendously physically, he, he's got a little baby. And so, you know, my 700 is coming up. I'm up next. His baby starts to choke. So now this baby chokes, and they got the, they got the squad there for 20 minutes. They finally revived, get the baby, okay? Then I pulled my first 700. But um, um, Jack, Jack was the head of the Teamsters, and... Uh, 
I just tell you one little story. His brother, they beat up his brother one time. So his brother called and says, you got to go over here. He's over at this guy's house. So he took the guys out of black. So they ran over there. They took dumbbells and everything. They beat the crap out of everybody. They tore the siding. They tore the phone out of the house. And the cops pull up. And they walk up. And the cops just roll in there like five cruisers. And Jack goes over, reaches in the window, talks to them. And they just left. <laughs> <laughs> and why they were still beating the guys up. And Jack always told me, he said, Lou, if you ever need a, if you ever need a, a, a favor, you just let me know. I said, okay, Jack, I will. And I knew what that was, but I never asked. But they, they were called the Wild Bunch for a good reason. They were absolutely crazy. It was, one of them go through a wall before or something? That... Oh, yeah. Well, I was up there one day. They, they started out at, the, John had a, a house gym. And that's where they started. And the guy was messing up. And they ran his head through the wall. And uh, also, um, big super heavyweight out of West Virginia, Luke Himes. The guy would tell me, he said, never been embarrassed in his life. He said he, he would be good two uh, plates. He'd eat off two plates at the same time. And he didn't give a damn if people watch him do that or not. So he said, never been embarrassed. They were in L.A. at a, at a big restaurant, real fancy restaurant, and Blacks and all these guys were in. Somebody got their name mixed up. And so they go, um, they go first to get in, they go, uh, they thought their name was Sedaris, but some get their own name, and he goes, so they're going like, what the fuck, you know? When are you going to go get our chair? So he finally does, and they'll bring the food. And so Jack, uh, Luke said he's sitting there, and Jack goes, slams the table as hard as he can in his fancy-ass restaurant, and says, where's the food, bitch? <laughs> he said, that's the only time in life he's ever bears. <laughs> that, that was just typical. Nebraska one time, he bombs out, and to me, uh, in 1977, he bombs out. So one thirty in the morning, he's outside in cowboy boots and his underwear, walking up and down the street, going, "I can't believe I bombed out." You know, I wasn't about to say nothing. <laughs> and that's where Tom, I told you, we're coming out. John Florio, good friend, just died. Uh, this is 1977. Him and and Jack, they're dressed up like gangsters, and I'm, I'm halfway dressed up, you know. And we're getting on the getting ready to get on a plane, and a security guard walks up and says, "Let me tell you three right now. I had a I shaved my head in 1973. No one done that." And he walked up and said, let me tell you three right now. If you got any guns, you better get rid of them or you're going on a plane. <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking at this guy, and Florio gets in front of me, puts his fist in the guy's face, and says, see these? We don't need any guns. <laughs> I mean, today we'd be locked up, you know, and the guy goes, all right, go ahead. <laughs> That's just a few of the stories. Yeah. Uh, Mary told me a story. At the same time, when uh, Titus is that deadlift, I guess, the judges, and they said, you can't do that, and he, he said, fuck you. Yeah, a whole way up. And, t and the head referee turned down twice. I want to turn the wheels down. <laughs> no way, dude. I got another deadlifter. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 859 just out. Get down. He got kicked out of the gym one time because he tried to pull 773 and missed it. And got down on hands and knees and barked like a dog and run his head into the plates. <laughs> so the guy kicked him out. I said, dude, this is Dave. Um, is it Dave was the name of the gym. Uh, and I said, damn, Dave's the only lifter you got. Why'd you kick him out? I mean, the guy pulled 859, 242. Um, you know, Tom, back in those days right there, uh, I talked about my first training partner, and then Gary Sanger. Uh, well, Bill Whittick was the first, and, uh, you know, he's a vet now. He's a, uh, getting their PhDs and become a vet. Gary Sanger's the head of economics. Tom Pellucci was a, became a, um, a psychologist and an attorney. So I started out, these guys I had were highly educated. You know, I barely got out of high school, but they all come to me for advice way back then, training. And Jimmy Seicher was a, um, he told two of these, but Jimmy was a Mr. USA and third and fifth to Mr. America's. And he's stranger in fiction, as we well know, right, Tom? He's still come by and see me. So, and then, uh, so, and then later on, a few years later, Matt breaks the world record in the squat and then, um, um, you know, gets in a lot of trouble. Matt was always in a lot of trouble with the law and everything. And uh, he's like my stepson. And, I mean, dangerous stepson you've ever seen. So, whatever, you know, we'd always go somewhere and all hell would break like, like Mark Marin. Now, you could, you could go to church and Mark could get in a fight. So I think that's why Mark runs strong style MMA today. and um, But, you know, about that time, um, I, I lifted in, in 79 seniors, and um, I pulled 672 over. I got second place locked up to Larry, and I tore my bicep ball. Uh, ball slips and fingers. They tear, tear my biceps. So I go from locked up second to zero. So I got to – and I remember Larry, you know, I'm on the platform, and Larry's already on me with an ice bag. And then I never took a pain pill in my life. My buddy Vince White, he had me all these pills and take these. So I did. I was on Queer Street. I didn't know where the hell I was. And uh, so come back, and I got no bicep, you know, tore it totally off of my right arm. And I, I get back, and uh, two doctors said, uh, 
you got to operate on it. One said, don't do it. So if you don't care what it looks like, don't operate. So I was a steel, I did steel erection. I was already connected to steel on a Wednesday, and I got back Sunday. And, um, but also, and also Mike Lambert said I was done. This, this is 1979. said, I'm, I'm done. I'll never come back from that injury. And, and you know, within the, when the magazine came out, it's called Meltdown of Mississippi. And um, I uh, already dealt it in Iraq. I started working all over 700 on high pins. Well, six months later, I won my first nationals. I pulled 705 in that meet, and I benched 480, and there's no bench shirts, uh, weighed 212, squatted 765, world record 782. And, of course, that means I get two holes in my stomach, tear a 10 on my pelvic bone. So I recovered from that, managed to pull 722 at about 212, real easy, just missed 744. I mean, I was all jacked up, and, you know, I took a shot of adrenaline, which is common to do back then. I was flying, and I just lost my mind and, and got uh, hamstring cramp while I was flying the bar up <coughs> and so but then then after that i decided i was working out of town a lot i had to work i couldn't get a lot of meets i never got vacations i was a crane operator and i did steel erection um so i i drove to cincinnati as, as tom knows about an hour and 45 minutes from here 18 weeks in a row i walked out there's no monoliths in, in these days walked out eight to nine hundred pounds and i i think what happened was i eventually uh, broke my back and i felt like i had a broken leg i had a, a shearing pain away around my right leg and but then one night I had two girls, Laura, Fel Laura Dodd and Mariah Liggett, two monster women. But that's the only two was there. So I said I want to take a little box squat. So I tried a seven and a quarter. You know, it's hardly any gear off a of off a twelve inch box, and I missed it. So I put the pins in my power rack like I always do. So I dumped the weight forward, but I put the pins too low. It smashed me in between the box and the bar, had me smashed in there. And so they had low all the weights. I finally get the weights off of me. I get up, they get the bar on my back. I stagger around, fall down, get back on my head on the concrete floor. And my, I called a friend of mine who was a doctor here in town. He said, get me into a surgeon Monday. This is Friday night. So he did, he got me in. Uh, his name was Lee Howard. He was a, a psychiatrist. And uh, so Lee gets me into this surgeon. And the guy goes, bad news. I'm thinking traction. I mean, I messed up, boy. Um, this is the second time I broke my back. But um, I'm thinking I'm going to get traction. He said, I want to take out uh, two discs. Fuse your back and take off bone spurs. I'm going like, what? And so he tells me to, um, <laughs> uh, you know, come back in a couple of days later and we'll start uh, doing the, getting the procedure going. I said, okay, I never went back. I mean, I broke it in 73 and um, I had a 670 deadlift. I'm coming out of Toledo. This is why this sport taught me humility. Many people are arrogant, but I guess you hang around enough, it might teach them. I don't know. But I come back from Lee, Ohio, no help. I didn't need help. There's no gear. So my back's indestructible. I just told a 1655, and Vince won the world's a 1635 two months before. Mm -hmm. So I was on top of the world. And I said, my back's indestructible. Well, I broke it two months later, doing good mornings down at Ohio State. They hauled me home. I laid on my floor for two days, um, peeing in a coffee can. They couldn't even get me on the couch. So I was off and on crutches for <coughs> 10 months. And uh, nothing helped me, and I eventually come up back in 73, early 74, with a reverse hyperextension exercise. And a lot of people claim I never invented some crazy-ass can in it, a freaking hoser up there. And like I told him, I probably didn't invent it, near did you. I'm sure there's some Soviet doing it 100 years ago. <coughs> and, uh, but, you know, that's a different story. But, now, but because of that, that's why I'm here today, and I've had six United States patents on that machine. So it's funny how things go. But, you know, I broke that back the second time. I said to myself, there's got to be a better way to train. And But what was it? So I called Bud Chaconigan out of uh, uh, Michigan. I said, Bud, I, I need these books, these weightlifting books you got. He goes, well, no, you know, Lou, they're, um, they're um, basically classroom books. I said, exactly what I want. I mean, I was doing something wrong, but what was it? So a year after reading these books, um, I figured out I lacked science. And I started doing, you know, some of what they were talking about. And um, the first thing I did, got in and started using Perlman's chart. How many reps is minimal and maximal? How many sets and how many lifts per workout? That way I wasn't overtraining or undertraining like I always did. Um, weight periodization. Um, and Mark Off and guys like this, they set up weight periodization, pigeon weights. So I started following that advice. That was the next thing I did. One thing led to another to another. And then um, how I could control my volume and intensities and train optimal. Um, so finally I didn't overtrain and uh, I started making progress again and everyone jumped on the bandwagon we started doing it and the whole gym got stronger and stronger and stronger um, so that's uh, that leads me up to meeting Mel Siff you know years later because um, I just kept going and I mean all of a sudden I could barely lift now I'm blowing up weights I never I never dreamed I could blow up at you know at, at 40 years old and 
So I, I met Mel, and he came to see us. Mel hated everybody. You know, he thought everybody was idiots. Mel wrote Super Training. This is the book of all books. And so Mel comes here, and we hit it off, and he sees what we're doing. And um, so I started doing seminars with Mel because if Mel would talk. No one knew what he's talking about. I kind of get this right now, right, Tom? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm, I'm on the low level, and that's why I don't like to do seminars because a lot of people have no idea what I'm talking about. So I would have to fill in the, <laughs> the words where Mel has got him totally confused. But um, it was because of a Mel it got me where I was. And one of the smartest things he ever said, a very, very smart man, one of the smartest I knew. I mean, I've known Dr. Romanov. I, I know all kind of people. Bulgarian Olympic team doctor was here. All these incredibly smart. But Mel said something to me at a seminar in Vegas. And it's funny because uh, Tommy Malinsky was there. He's a strength coach for the Jags right now. He said he remembers, he remembers this, this day too. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, Mel's supposed to start at 8 o'clock. He don't show up. So I start talking. And because we talked all it was nine to nine, two days in a row, or eight to eight to nine, two days in a row. So I start freaking talking, and about nine o'clock, Mel burst in the door. Sixty-five people there, most of them from overseas. And he's got his wife in a wheelchair, and she gives her a big shove, shoves her like ten feet out. <coughs> Everybody's like, what the hell? And he runs right up in front of me on stage and starts to talk right in front of me, like I'm not even there. His hair's hanging every which way. And uh no, Mel, I mean, he's just a fruitcake. You know, I love the guy. So I just sat down and listened to him. And they're looking like, what's wrong with this man? What's wrong? I'm going, hey, hey, what the hell? So he goes on. He goes, he, about a minute into the conversation, he goes, he goes, you never train minimally. And I'm back there. Me and Chuck, I'm working out with Vogelpool and these guys, you know, forever. I go, yeah, that's for pussies. He goes, you never train maximally. I go, wait a minute. That's what I've done all my life. He says, you always train optimally. That's the most profound thing the man ever said to me, at least sunk in my little head, because... Every chart says optimal, but I always train maximal. And a lot of people ask me today, like in the squat, why do we do the maximal? Because we wear briefs. Olympic lifters didn't have briefs. You know, so we do. We can do more work than Olympic lifter because we get to wear briefs. But that was some of the most uh, profound things ever, you know, that um, happened to me. And it just got me to read a lot of books. Um, you know, uh, basically Verfashansky and Medvedev and all these people. Medvedev said you must use bands and corns. Uh, this is an article he had in 1967. But what the hell is he talking about? How do I put a bungee cord on an 800-pound bar? That ain't going to work. Um, so uh, Dave Williams come up to me one time, called me up and said, uh, he's at Liberty University, he said, Lou, if you do experiments with bands, um, I'll pay you. Tell me what to do with them. Because he was always afraid of looking stupid, which I said, who cares you look stupid? You know, you know, who cares? I've never, never bothered me. So I said, well, I'm not going to charge you, but I'll do it. But I said, well, what kind of bands are you talking about? It's Dick Hartzell. Uh, and jump stretch at the time. So did come to Columbus that very weekend for a basketball seminar. And I, w I took Dave Tate with me, and I went up there, and I saw these bands. I told him who I was. He looked back. He didn't know who I am, you know. And I said, I don't know. I put these bands on my shoulder, squat up and down, and I said, I've got to have these bands. I said, dude, I said, I said we're, we're pretty famous. We're going to make you sell a lot of bands. And I remember Dick looked at me like, you're crazy. And I, I gave him to Dave, and on Dave's on the, going home, and his bands are like, well, what the hell are we going to do with these and I went back and hooked him up to the bar, and the rest is history. And, you know, Mel, um, he credits me a combination method uh, training and super training, which, uh, you know, and I'm pretty proud to be in super training. There's only a couple of pictures, you know, me and Serge Redding, I believe. So it's, uh, it's a proud thing that Mel put me in there for that. And he thought we really had it going on. He did a lot of experiments here, and then the poor man died. We wanted to prove, I believe, you could override the goji tendon by using an enormous amount of bands on the eccentric phase. He believed it well, and then the poor man died, and I can't get a professor to come here. So that's how that went. You got something else? Um, what year are we up to now? Up to oh, early 80s. Well, actually 90s. Um, the gym atmosphere in that time, let's just say after you broke your back, because you, you had men's men in the gym back then, and the fact that you could get these guys to follow and to train but one thing I've noticed and even to today that uh, whenever you fuck yourself up it's never you're like well what do I got to do to fix it it's never oh I'm injured or something's wrong because it's always something to hurt you've got this drive to adapt or fix or to, you got to find the answer and you said the answer is always in the gym but back then did the gym atmosphere was that, was that a big driving force or is it just all internal did it come from here or did it come from the gym? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. It came from everybody. Um, you know, I, like I said, I learn, I learn a lot from the guys in the gym. Um, I'll get into that later on, but yeah. I guess I can talk about it now. But, you know, you talk about driving force. Um, 
I'm 43 years old, blew my kneecap off, ruptured my patella completely off. And I remember telling Chuck I broke my knee, you know, and uh, my blood pressure 110 over, uh, it's, one, it's 110 over 70, take me to the hospital. Well, later on, they tried to kill me. I'm allergic to anesthesia. So I'm in intensive care for four or five days, hospital a couple more. Well, Chuck Vogelpoor, my wife picked me up and he take me to the gym. Uh, and that's on a Tuesday. And then that Saturday, so I drive to the gym. And my legs are still in a cast, and I got, I, I almost died. I mean, they trained me. Uh, I didn't breathe for four minutes. They ran in and cut my throat while I'm, a lot, while I'm awake and put chest tubes in me. That was a lot of fun. And uh, so, but, so I got stitches in my sides. I got tape across my throat. I didn't need a trach. I could talk because of the strain of my life, I guess. And then, uh, so I go into the gym on Sunday. I walk in, vocal pole, those guys in there, and they go, you're maxing out, motherfucker. I, I just nearly died a week ago. I mean, I didn't breathe for four minutes. And I look at him, and I go, you're maxing him out, motherfucker. And there was a, a hassock that's in the gym today. It's the same hassock with 10,000 pounds of tape on it. Hey, uh, so he sent me down. I laid down, and um, I, I, met, I, I maxed out. It's a 355 bench. I went in the hospital. It was August 4th. I said, because uh, I said, I'm going in because I, I knew I had anesthesia problems. I mean, it, you know, they knew it too. They had screwed up. But I go, I might die. So I went to bench speed, dismissed a five, uh, in a shirt 535, but I could bet raw bench 500 at that time. So that's just how it went. But that's what that's the difference between the gym. Uh, why did I do it? Because they made me do it. It wasn't made me. I wanted them to make me do it. Also, when I tore my knee off, I come back and I want to, I remember I wanted to uh, squat 500 on a box. So I do 500 and I shit way over and hurt my hip. And I'm going, oh, I'm glad this is over. And vocal pulls slamming 525 on the bar. So you can do 525. Oh, what the hell? So I got to do 525, hurt my hip worse. A couple of months go by, I'm squatting again. I, I said, I'm going to do 550. I do 550. Chuck said, you can do 575. He's already slamming that on to hurt my hip again. This went on and on and on. Took me right up to the top. I mean, if it wasn't for Chuck and Dave Tate and, um, and, a, and a lot of guys in my gym, um, I would today I don't think I could do it. They don't have the mentality to push me. Uh, they didn't care. I mean, they, they wanted to see if they could kill me. What did Dave Tate say? He wanted to hurt me every day because yeah. he knew I wanted to hurt him. I mean, Dave was zippy in the gym. Dave Tate never was in my gym. So don't ever let anyone tell you Dave Tate was ever at one side. Zippy Tate walked in the front door. And Zippy Tate walked out the door and then he came, became Dave Tate again. Because he had another personality. He was in the gym. He's crazy. You always said that Louis Simmons never entered West. Never. When, was that always like that? Like oh. when you ever... As soon oh. as you went to the gym, it was never Louis. It was whoever you were then. Yeah. I was always, I couldn't, you can't be a normal person to do what you want to do. You got to be able to turn it on. You got to walk in. You got to, that's why your training partner's got to be good atmosphere. You know, if you run with the lame, you develop a limp. So you can't run with the lame. You got to develop, hang with top guys. And, uh, but the, the, those guys, you know, and, and, and Kenny Parrish, is, you know, I started Kenny 14 years old and he's a good kid. He swears he never said this, but he did. Because after I tore my knee off, I was going to lift. I was 43 years old. So that was in 91. So it's like, a, or uh, so it's like close to, it's 98. And I, Kenny's breaking world records in the bench, him and George and Rob Fusner. And I, but he's, Kenny's stalled. And I said, Kenny, I said, you're, you're never going to, I said, I'm going to come out of retirement squad seven before you ever been seven again. And he said, old man, you'll never have 700 <coughs> pounds on your back. Well, if there's anyone else outside my gym, I'll smack him in the face. But I, I remember looking at him. And I thought, you know what, Kenny? I'm out of retirement right now. I did seven, eights, and nines. And, but unfortunately, Kenny never broke that world record. And I've always said, I stole this to George Halbert, that um, uh, I, got a, you know, Kenny, I got a lot from Kenny, but Kenny didn't get a lot from me mm -hmm. in that respect. And George Halbert used to trade with Kenny. And J.M., Kenny was immensely strong with a great lockout. George worked on that. J.M. was a super strong guy, but not real fast. He worked on super strength. George was explosive, so, and George said one day that I learned off of them, but they didn't learn anything from me. And so that's why you want to look at training. Don't be in your own shell. Think you know something you don't know because you don't. You know, if someone asks you a question, you might not have the answer. I got guys in the gym like that right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like guys to feed off each other. It was constant contest. Uh, when Mark Marinelli was there for Strong Style, you know, he trained Stipe and Evo I and everybody. Uh, you cannot get out of the gym without a wrestling match at the bare minimum. In my house, tipping my couches over stuff. My wife was ready to kill people. And then uh, that's just the way they was. And huge brawls in the bars around town. You know, it was funny as shit. But uh, back then, looking back. But 
Uh, and then, uh, but it was always a very fierce atmosphere. A lot of money being bet on on it. You come in, you couldn't get out the door. Uh, one day, uh, Vocal Pole had a friend. He's kind of a deadbeat. And he said, he out deadlifted the sweeters at my gym, Esco. And I said, no, Chuck, uh, Esco out there. He said, no, he didn't. I said, Chuck, I was there. And there's only two people in the parking lot. It's this big ass, 265 pounds of muscle. Well, gets up in my face, puts his finger in my face. He goes, I'll tell you what. Says, tomorrow, this is Sunday, says, Monday, we'll have a deadlift contest. Said, it's you and Chester, John Stafford, um, him and this uh, Tony, and uh, there's two uh, 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 heavyweights from South Africa that's been six months here. I says, all right. So he says, make sure you tell everybody. So I called, because it's a holiday, but we didn't matter. We trained, we don't miss. Trained on, on New Year's, we don't care. We trained. So that day, that next day, we show up, and we film it um, as teams. And me and Chester tied him and Tony. I tear my hand, Chuck tears a hand, Chuck tears a hamstring. No one says shit, and then we just keep running over the next day. That's how it was. Money, $200 on a box for a box squat. One time, um, you know, Chuck, he's back at my gym, and I think he's ready to help out my guys, and maybe he'll inspire and get us some atmosphere. Um, we have a, a squat contest. So me and Joe McCoy beat him and his Don Dameron, another, a big kid, and I took the last squad. It's another team thing. And, I'm, of course, I'm running my, my mouth like I always do. And I, I turn, I walk out of the monolith, and he's already got a deadlift bar blowing it up. And he goes, we're having a deadlift contest now. I said, I didn't say nothing about no deadlift contest. He said, well, we're having one. Well, you had to have one. I mean, you back out of a contest, you're gone. They kicked me out. They just made me mail the rent in. Remember, the night crew wanted me to mail rent in. They hated me. So, But that's the way the gym was, constantly, you know, uh, up in your face. And, I mean, but it was no joke either. You used to say that, uh... Matt Dillon used to get goosebumps. He used to say, oh. before he walk in the door, he just, he get all. He would come in my garage because we moved out there. Matt was a super big emotional guy, and, and he would walk in. He go, oh, I get goosebumps. Nah, you're full of crap, Matt. You're crazy. But I had him too. So, I get very emotional. That's why I try to stay calm as much as I can, because yeah. <laughs> I can kind of get off the hook, you know, sometimes. Well, that was one thing that everyone that we've talked to has brought up, uh, especially the guys who were there through the 90s, was that when you came back, you know, after Kenny said that to you, uh, especially for guys like like uh, Dave Tate, that he came in in that interim after you you retired, and then he, you know, he heard all about it, and then he suddenly got to see how the whole energy kicked up when you came back in. That time, that's what kills my gym now. I can't go in there. I can't, I'm all beat up. I'm six, eight years old. Um, you know, Kenny brought me back, my first meet back. back a lead total was like a pro total day. You know, the gear was not that much. And, and then, so my first meet, uh, my dream, my dream was a total lead total. I hadn't lifted in five or six years. I'll be damned somehow I did it. <laughs> I thought I was going to bench 435. I ended up benching 500. And I total lead. And I thought, Christ, how did I do that? Like 47, 48 years old. Uh, well, then years later, I got all banged up and out. And actually did it at 63 years old. I did 50 over at 1885 at 220 because I had to. I owed it to my trainer partners. And whenever I lifted, uh, I remember uh, I I couldn't fail. I got Chuck behind me. I got these guys. I got uh, Big Tim Harold, 470 pound. I got all these uh, monsters in my gym. I can't fail. If I get in a fight, I'm going to fight till I die. I'm not going to fucking lose in front of my friends. You know, so that made it fun. And then we had a great night crew back in, run their mouth. Uh, we always kicked their ass. I always said the, the night the AM crew is eight hours ahead of the night in crew, twelve hours. And uh, but I was at meet one time and I squatted nine twenty. And, and Gabe Ryder, he's in the night crew. He squatted like eight forty, you know. But run his mouth as much as anybody. Send me death threats on the fat machine. This kind of stuff all the time on the answering phone, you know. So I squat at nine twenty and I look out in the audience. It's York Barbell, and you look down. It's on a big platform. I see Gabe down there, and he's he's got a shirt. And he's coming up to say something, and I go, I own you, boy. Because he had that West Side shirt under a flannel shirt. And he goes, fuck you, old man. And uh, I remember, um, you know, what's his name? The guy runs uh, the, uh, the IPA over uh, you know, Mark Chalet. Mark says, oh, we can't handle trouble. We can't handle trouble. But that was a good day, you know. Get to run my mouth with guys in my gym. No one run. If I run my mouth now, they get, they're get almost scared of me. <laughs> I can't figure it out. Uh, Marcus, I can talk with him. and uh, uh, Every... Um past members I've talked to, like they all said the best time of their life here. But Marcus uh, said that uh, the worst thing you can do is miss a weight at Westside because he gets so mad you go home and he stare at a wall until he, he had to go back in the gym because you, you weren't a person. If you miss that weight, you, you have to come back and get it. And he said he dropped a, a keg 
on his toe, and his toe swelled up. And he's like, well, what do I do? He goes, we'll put a hole in it. So he got a drill, a long drill bit, and drilled straight down to it. <laughs> Released it, went off and lifted, and he had to deadlift. He said, no matter what. And then you used to bet for pizzas and for... Oh, it, was always, it just couldn't just be anything. It had to have something on it, you know. That makes it fun. Now, like, well, Mark, what, a couple of days ago, you saw him carrying a safety squat bar by half a mile or something in a snow blizzard, no shirt on. That's still marked to this day. Yeah. You know, Tom, it's funny, uh, those guys, those are my training partners, Been I like to call my intellectual training partners. Mm -hmm. You know, I started reading about um, Bert Fashansky and Zaza Zorsky and all these guys, and I started, because in 1992, actually, kind of going back a little bit, I'm going like, well, am I really doing the Soviet system or not? So the first edition of uh, Science of Practice and Strength Training came out. I read it. If anyone reads it, it's West Side. You know, what we're doing that, you know, you can look at it that way. But I'm going like, I am fairly much on track of what the Soviets were doing. And not long ago, a friend of mine, Danny Blankenship, takes a class in Penn State uh, with uh, Zasazorsky on the practice of science strength training. And Danny asks him, says, what do you think of, you know, Louis Simmons? He goes, well, he must be, he must be doing it 99%. That's kind of a compliment. A big compliment we had, I, I, I wrote a, um, a book review for Ver Fashansky. And then he died, and his daughter asked if I'd still do it. And I said, hell yeah, I'd do it. Because like writing in the Bible, you know, if he was a religious person. So, um, but that's what I started doing that and reading. And the more I read, it seemed like the more I, I learned. And, you know, this one thing led to another. You just got to keep learning. And uh, how, did you just naturally, just by trial and error, combine everything? You said, well, that makes sense. I'm going to try with this. Was it like, because you could take the theoretical and put it into the practical and you figured out, well, that will work, but this won't work. Was it true that or is it, <coughs> did it just come naturally? It just made sense? Well, I think that's the way my brain works. But then I had guys experiment and do anything. For, we started first using chains and Dave Tate was in that group and uh, we experimented uh, for three meets for a year and a half. Then I wrote about them. I want to make sure, I just uh, people write about stuff that they don't even do. But we wrote about a success, same thing with bands. Three major meets, bands took us to another level. It also cost me a shoulder, cost Dave Tate, um, I think a bad shoulder injury, uh, and a squat. And uh, George Halbert and Rob Fuser, um, jo George had all kind of injuries, and, and Rob tore his pec totally off by using too much band. But someone had to use too much to find out what's unknown. A lot of times, no one wants or willing to do that. You know, someone's got to sacrifice for, for the most people. I think that's a big thing people underestimate nowadays. As you said, a lot of bad information out there, but these guys haven't done jack shit. They haven't. I don't have any experience. I was I made top ten in nineteen seventy two. I made top ten deadlift in um thirty three years later. Well seven fifteen and fifty seven years old. I learned a lot from that time. I learned a lot from a lot of people. And uh, I kinda wanted to, to get into that. You know, uh, I mean, where did I learn boss squats? You brought it up a while ago, uh, you know, from the West Side Barbell Club. And uh, I asked um, you know, vocal pool. I started Chuck. I got my fifth elite. So only three hundred people I think's ever done it. I got my fifth elite and it was Chuck's first meet. And, and so um, I, but I would ask Chuck, he would do these enormous heavy rack pulls, like a thousand pound rack pull. Um, or, and I, I asked him why he does it. And he looked at me, he goes, to teach me how to strain. I go, well, if anyone knows how to strain, it's Chuck Vogelpool. But then I got to think about it farther and I said, well, maybe that's how he learned how to strain. Because the coincidental, um, Steve Goggins does, would do the same thing. Heavy rack pulls, he did leg press. You know, of course we did box squats and, and, and he did the leg press and extremely heavy rack pulls and immensely strong. I mean. Uh, person and I asked him one time I says Chuck when you because we're using bands for everything I mean tons and tons of bands and I said what do you what do you get by pulling heavy deadlifts of bands heavy bands and he thought again and he said uh, it teaches me to think while I'm straining a lot of people can't do both our friend Dorian just wrote an article you have to be comfortable when you're uncomfortable and that's basically the same thing and, uh, you know, when weights get heavy, people panic. And they get them going in their own direction. So I learned a lot. I taught Chuck a lot, but I learned a lot back from Chuck. Mm -hmm. And he, like I said, him and Dave Tate, especially too, because Chuck is a, a freaking ditch digger. He just wants to bury it with training. And Dave Tate was a, is a cheat. He'd always try to cheat you and lie. So he made it fun while you were getting killed. And um, Dave, one time, we were in the gym, and Jay, he's all zippied up. And he's, your box is high, your box is high, my box ain't high. And Joe McCoy says, your box is high. I'm taking an inch off. He says, no, 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 take nobody. You take an inch off, I'll punch you in the mouth. I'll punch you in the mouth. He's going crazy. <laughs> so Joe McCoy, could, he makes the poke kill somebody. So Dave takes the weight out. Joe takes an inch off the box. Dave goes down, barely gets up, 
racks that way, turns around. He's ready to kick all our asses. And he could have kicked my ass because I got tears running down my face. It's the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Just ranting and raving, going crazy. And that's the kind of stuff we did all the time, you know, but it made it fun. But, uh, but like I said, those guys, I believe that's how I did it. Um, what I did over 50 was because of Chuck and them. It's just, how could I feel I got them there, you know? Uh, remember I told you before, you run with a limb, you develop a limb. Run with people like that. Don't associate yourself with people less than yourself. Always try to make yourself better by the people around you. I think that's a big thing why well, you always tell me that uh, if you have one bad egg or one bad influence in the gym, you got to get rid of it because it affects everybody. And that's a big thing. And then you'd introduce a, a new stimulus, whether it be a machine, whether it be a training partner, or whatever. It's that um, yin and yang. You always make sure there's an ebb and flow to the gym so there's always progress being made. Yeah, you see, I mean, right now we can just kick out a couple guys, at least for a couple weeks. Um, because they didn't come to the meet and help. I mean, you know, I the they had to come to meet. This is all planned for months, months, and they don't show. And the one shows up at the deadlifts. He said, you're talking, he's what, Tom, five, six hours late. And he goes, I didn't know what to do. It was, Lord, am I training partner or Lord, you guys? I said, well, you know what, dude? We're the lifters. You should have, the word was you should have picked. So Tommy ends up kicking him up for two weeks. And that's just, that's, you know, I hope it teaches him a lesson. I doubt it, to be honest with you. I doubt it. It was a different generation. I mean, I would die if someone kicked me out of this gym for two weeks. I, I wouldn't know what I'd do. I'd, just, I'd, I'd, I'd go crazy. Mm -hmm. The rest of the way. I have a question. Uh, if yeah. you didn't own that gym, would you be kicked out of Barbell? What? If you didn't own the gym. No. Would it be one of the best, one of the guys to get kicked out of the gym? If you didn't own that gym here, if you're just one of the guys, normal guys, you would be one of the, the ones to get kicked out? Uh, no. Why? Because I never miss. I'm first one there. I'm at breakfast at quarter after five. The rest I don't up till six. I trained last night at 10 o'clock. And probably at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> on Sunday, sometimes I'm in the gym at five before George and his group shows up at, at 10 after six. I train. You got to train. You got to do what you can do. I, I might not be able to kill bear no more, but I could kill rabbits. <laughs> Go to the gym every day and try to kill something. Me. And, uh, you know. You, like Matt Brown said, live fast and you know die young, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to go fast. The faster I go, the better I like it. You said one wrong word there. Normal. This man ain't normal. Tommy watched me. I haven't met Tommy, any normal people in that gym. Tommy watched me break my foot in the squat. They heard a break, <laughs> and I, uh, AJ thought I tore my knee off. You know, broke my knee. So I said, "Well, let me see." And I did a second rep and tore my groin. And I go, "Let no weight scare me out." Years ago, Jeff Corpin, it was a big 750 dealer way back in the early 80s. We're in my gym in the garage, and I took, um, um, I said my, I was hurting my, uh, I thought my uh, lower back was out, mm -hmm. and my hamstring was tied. I said, well, watch it, make sure you know, I don't kill myself. I get out and tore my tensor fascia, my IT man. You know, I heard it snap. So I'm laying there, I, uh, you know, I missed the weight, he get off, I'm sitting there. And, and Jeff walked up to me, and he goes, can I say something? I go, sure. So that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I go, what? He goes, you know you were hurt, but you took that weight. And I said, well, when I let anything scare me, then I'm done. And I ain't letting nothing scare me yet. I ain't scared of losing. You know, a man that's not afraid to lose has nothing to lose. I have nothing to fucking lose. You know, if Carter's beat me up, I'm just on a, a list of 500 people that, if he could beat me up, uh, I'd be on I a, could try. <laughs> I would, I would just be on a long list of other people. So what do I give a damn? I remember I trained Mark. Uh, you know, Mark Cohen would never come in because he said he, had, he would have to train too hard. But if Kevin Randall would beat me up, well, I mean, so what? He's beat how many? I'd just be in that big list of losers. So what? What do I care? You know, so never be afraid of losing. If a person's afraid to lose, will never win. You said when you, you competed, you never saw anyone in front of you. It's just you and the weight. No, I actually, one thing I would do, I'd look at the audience when they disappeared. It was I was on. And, uh, you know, I use another ego, which I won't talk about. I have my own name and never tell anyone. Um, but uh, that's how I did it. And it, was, it, it would be dangerous. If I was out of shape, I could very hurt myself. Uh, I, I seen that when we were doing the, uh, remember we were doing the isometrical at the Bambella Bar? And uh, I did three minutes, three and a half. And then you went, all right, fuck it. And then you just sat down. It's like you meditated. And boom. And then five minutes pass. I'm still going. Five and a half. Still going. Then six just puts it up and boom. Grab, grip contest. Yeah. And did you, uh, 
throughout, and there's always this big correlation with you, Kung Fu, that, of course, the Shogun's assassin. But did uh, meditation and Tai Chi, did all that play a huge part into uh, controlling um, your emotions for lifting? Yeah, Mike Bridges told me I should go to a metaphysics expert, <clears throat> and so I did. And uh, But long before that, I started doing Tai Chi in 1970. But I basically thought, instead of using you know, the chin style or whatever, why not do it for the bench press? Why not do it for the squat and the deadlift? That's what I fucking do. So I always did that. And I, I used mental imagery, if you want to call it astral traveling. <coughs> That's what I learned from my metaphysics teacher. So, I mean, I basically have no fear. Uh, even when I tore my knee off and I take a weight out, my, my brain, and I'm not a tough guy, but my brain goes forward. My brain don't make me go backwards. So I take a weight out, and there's no fear anymore. Once I got a bar on my back, because I'm in a fight. If you jump on me, I got to hit you, right? So take a weight out. I have no fear of getting hurt. It's on. I mean, it's, I instantly can turn it on. And I don't know. I think over the years I taught myself to do that. But some people, we see, we see people lifting weights going up, and they'll stop pulling them. They don't even stop. The bar hasn't stopped, and they'll let go of the bar. So, you know me, I'll go to I freaking pass out and everything else if it's what it takes, you know. So it's just a learned experience. But, uh, yeah, Tom, uh, the Tai Chi did wonders. To this day, I mean, you know, go to my house. I got a, I got a Tai Chi book right, right underneath my table. Well, I remember you, you gave me this, uh, it was a book. It wasn't the Iron Stomach, it was I'm Breathing. And I'm going through this book, and I'm looking at and I'm reading it. I'm looking at Lou. And everything the book is saying about breathing, you look at him, he's watching TV, not even because he's done it somewhere. He said, nothing's going through his chest, it's all going through his belly. I'm like, God damn this motherfucker. Because he does things slightly. He'll put a book in front of you, won't say a word, or he'll tell you a story, he'll walk off. And uh, it took me a while, but I see it. And there's one thing um, where, what are we doing? He's doing a waste to the, the throat. Uh, throat. And uh, he, was, uh, he was getting spurred on to do something. And the guys were looking at him going, what's he doing? But they're motivating him. It wasn't the other, or other way around. They couldn't understand what he was doing. He was trying to just to prove a point. And they're in La La Land. Because um, they're bitches. <laughs> and, um, that's a, a big part of the, psycholo the psychology of what you do here is huge. But and I think that goes uh, a long way. But right now, people just don't get that. They don't get the stories. And I, I think, uh, you know, if you watch uh, some of the old tapes, you watch Chuck Vogelbo come off a platform or Dave Tate getting out to the bar, hit his head, blowing blood everywhere. You're going to see a different group than you see today. Mm -hmm. You know, even Kenny Parrish was a pretty calm guy, but these kids got fired up, man. They got fired up. I mean, I had six guys that were all bench over 600. You know, this is in the mid, this is the early to mid 90s. That was, a, that was an everyday occurrence in my gym. Uh, in a meet, we've had two 650s and a 630. We don't lift raw. So it's just, it's all mental. I mean, every, it's not everything mental, you know. How many of those guys are still in the business today? None. Gone. Outlasting them all. It was one of my most disturbing things that I've started a person up and actually outlast them. <laughs> Probably you're the only one around that you still. Well, this say you, but Chuck. I mean, I. You know, like Chuck is really beat up, and um, at 50 years old, I was I was uh, I had the third best total, fourth best total in the world, second best squat. At 54, I was sixth best bench. At 57, tenth best deadlift. At 50 years old, these guys are all done. Did they not learn something from me? You know, sometimes you could be hard headed and try to prove me wrong, and what happens is eat yourself alive. Because uh, Tom, I tell you, I may say shit, piss people off, or I can say I got my own way to motivate you. But I can get the most out of a person. But what worries me, I'm not getting that much out of some of them. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, sport, <clears throat> the sport is very unforgettable. I mean, it just, it takes out of you. And, you, and, and then it punches your body into a level that you, you, will, you will pay later. Okay. So uh, the new generation has to see what happened with the old generation. That guys can barely walk sometimes, need to make no money. I mean, they all beat up. I mean, the new generation maybe don't want to be in the same in the same path in the next 20, 40 years from now. I mean, uh, Dave Hoff, for example, he don't want to get into the forties. You know, have to do two. I mean, I don't. It's just uh, would that be something <coughs> that they don't want to be like the old generation that they all gone? For example, you don't want around, kind of it, you know, and uh, they all gone. Well, it's like having sex. You want to go have having sex at twenty five? Want to have sex at sixty eight? Huh? Well, I like to have sex at sixty eight. And so I've never done, and I'm not done. I don't, I don't know how people can just give it up at 25. You know what? I always carried a calendar. 
And I looked at my best list. What the fuck did I do? Was it three years ago? What I've been doing for three years? Huh? Think about that. Think about that. Did you make, are you making any progress? Are you living in your own shadow? You think you're something you're not? You ain't done shit for three years and you're a young kid? That's what I think. You need to get your ass on the ball and make progress. I mean, how can you be done at not even 30 years old? I what? I had the 10th and the ninth strongest. Probably 26, 27. Mm -hmm. Walk out of the gym. Just quit. I had the fourth strongest. Three total world records. Uh, AJ, I just said breakfast, told me he was done. I, I don't know how you do this. Um, you know, how this happens is beyond me. And three years ago, we had a great meet in New York. be three years ago in August. Uh, Dave made the biggest total in the world. A year before, Donnie Thomas sold 3,000. Dave did 3,005. And since that meet, we've got nothing. Uh, a 900 deadlifter a year later was gone. 2755, he's probably the 15th strongest man to ever live. All these guys just quit. How do you quit? You know one thing about when you quit? You quit once you're a quitter. You're a quitter. To just know that you're a quitter. That's okay if you can live with it. I can go with you on that one. But since we started the journey of this movie, you know, uh, I've been learning a lot, especially with powerlifting. And I, a lot of the guys that we've been in talking and interviewing, uh, one of the common things that come in, you know, as far as when we ask them, why you're not in the business anymore? Why you're not in it? You know, has to do a lot with, uh, I mean, we need to find a living. I mean, we need to make money, you know, and uh, we need to, we don't make money on this. You know, we have families, we have some of the guys that just bring this, well, I have a family, I have to just kind of support, we don't make money on this, this is just for, it was a hobby that became me something more professional and then suddenly it's easy when people make money, uh, it's easy when, you know, so. so sounds like I call it making excuses, not money. I think the guys I know got the same job they had when they quit. <laughs> I don't think you got a better job. Tom, do you know of any? No, I don't. I mean, uh, you know, Josh is a salesperson. He was a salesperson when he, he got here. He's a salesperson when he quit. AJ, I think he's still, what does AJ do? Social media stuff? I mean, I think he's still doing the same thing. Yeah. Well, I was going to say... Um, he told, AJ told me, and this is okay, that he said he couldn't see himself doing it anymore. Yeah. But you know what? You might not see yourself doing it anymore today, but tomorrow you can see yourself doing it more. See, I always think tomorrow is going to bring something new. Well, what I was going to say was, uh, I asked you this, I've asked you this before in an interview, but uh, a lot of guys seem to have, you know, they have a number, they have an achievement in their head. They have, they've sort of built the top of the mountain for themselves in their mind. Yep. And once they get there, they don't they don't know where to go. Uh, what? And I asked you, you know, do you just keep sort of chasing white whales? You know, find one, you go catch another. Well, you know, do you ever master kung fu? They say you never master kung fu. You train all your life to be better. Every day you try to be better. Don't you try to be better every day at what you do? Do you call us every day? Absolutely. It, then what's the difference between you and those guys? What's the difference between you? Carter, what's the difference? You're going to world championship? You're young. In my, you're young. Yes. I wouldn't go to master crap, but you're, what, 40? Yes. But you're going to go compete. Yes. Why? Because you got that deep down desire to be the best. Or at least be as good as you can. You may not be the best, but you got to be, you know what, Tom, and you know this for a fact. I don't, I don't give a damn. Uh, about how good you are, but I want you to be as good as you can be. That's all I ask, to be as good as you can be. Um, I just don't see how I, I take, and, and it may be selfish because it's, and it's not about me, it's about my gym, and Tom will tell you this. Uh, it's all about the gym. You bring guys in, put a lot of time in them, and make all this progress, put 500 pounds on their total, and they walk out the door on you. If I was, Carlos is my bodyguard. He's my bodyguard, pay $1,000, every two days be my bodyguard. All of a sudden, Tommy pays him fifteen hundred dollars and he kicks my fucking ass. That would be disloyal to me, Absolutely. and that's what happens. They walk out; they're not my bodyguards no more. I think um, a big thing is you call a lot of things before it happens, and you're like, "I hope this doesn't happen," but you see these traits. And a big yeah, let's don't go through them. But have yeah. I not told you? And yeah. you found out. And um, so. I didn't believe him. I first came here. The first first two, I'm like, "This guy's fucking nuts. It doesn't happen." And then, sadly, you see it. You see the characteristics of what's happening. But a lot of the time, and I think you brought it up, is 
they put so much into getting that one lift and they put it all out and they never keep it they never keep off them they give everything they have and they get it and then they realize how much hard work it took and I think they go well, fuck I gotta do more because the higher you get the more work you do not the less and I think that is what gets a lot of people you know when you was a white belt you finally got a white belt that's how you start right yes okay and then you're going damn that worked my balls off but you yes. had to go to a better trainers and then got a brown belt yes and then you went to a black belt. I don't know. You, are you a black belt degree? You have degrees? Yes, yes. I'm second degree. Black okay. Belt, yes. Why didn't you just stop at a brown belt? Because a brown belt will kick most people's ass. I mean, let's face it. That is true. It becomes part of your life. It, it, it's not. It's not a. You know. It's not a for the sports. Not for the it's money. But it's becoming your life. You don't know what. You don't know to do anything else as good as that. Maybe you have something else, but. That's something that you do with a love, and then you do with a with a with a with a passion. And, yeah. You have a college education. Uh, I do. Yes. We have college because you could you could turn to all kind of things. True. And you're doing some film stuff right now. Yes, sir. But you're going to the black. You were going to the jujitsu world championship. Yes, for no money because there's no money involved the, in that. Then That's maybe it. you can answer the question that you asked me why these guys see because I don't know and I like I don't want to know. I don't want to know why a guy thinks he's got limits and stops because I don't think anyone has limits. Well, I, for a little bit of the powerlifting that I touch, it, it takes a lot of your body. Not that you should to don't fight and don't. Uh, <coughs> don't get me wrong, absolutely. I know I go with you, but. Um, it's um it's more guys in forties doing jujitsu than more guys in forties doing power lifting. Nowadays, no, now wasn't that wasn't that way twenty years ago? See, Chuck was uh, Chuck was one of the few people that went a heavyweight than lightweight in the WPO. Uh, There's a lot of real super strong. Matter of fact, I used to have guys got real strong at forty. They got stronger at forty. I don't know why. I've seen this over and over. I mean, I mean, don't they dream? You know, I have a dream. Every day I wake up. I'm an old man, but every day I dream. I live on dreams. I just, I fucking, I, I just, I'll never be sad. I told Tommy, you know, we just, we just made a big thing here at the gym, big business deal. Um, but I almost don't want to succeed on everything like the, the mechanical hyper. And I want some things not to succeed because I want them to eventually succeed. I take my goddamn time. I set a goal, break it, set a goal, break it, set a goal, break it. I don't have a goal. I have goals. You know what I'm trying to say? If you put a limit, I got one right now. That I'm not even telling you guys about, but I'm working on. Because if I didn't have a goal, I might as well just die. I don't get it. But you're not much different than me. But I see what you're saying. So maybe you got the answer. See, it is okay that you do, but I don't want to know the answer. I don't want to feel how that could possibly happen because if I did, it may happen to me, and then I I, I couldn't live myself. I mean, I total leap at 63 years old, and I'm thinking I can still total leap a one from my neck. I mean, I did 675 at 63 years old. And uh, you know what I mean? And was I satisfied? Hell no, I wasn't satisfied, but then my neck took a big hike. You know, I'm passing out in the warm-up room. And went from the, on the platform to the warm-up room. So, I mean, I'm going, I would have killed me and somebody else. I can't do that. But I, that's the, see, that's, I think that's the difference between me and other people. I don't see the world like everybody else has taught me well knows. I just, I don't see the world the same. I don't see the world, and I don't see people the same. When I look at a guy that's got all this potential, and they don't reach it, I'm, I'm just, I don't understand. That's why I never wanted to have kids. I thought I'd be a bad dad, because I'm a complete moron. But then again, you know, no one can raise kids. You raise money. He kills people for a living, you know, those, you know, the preacher somewhere. You know what the hell you're doing. So I, I didn't want to, you know, have responsibility like that. And then I, I bring guys in, and like I said, I've always noticed the guys that they got the least to lose gain the most. They, they don't, it's, not a, it's not a big job why they stop. That's it's not it. But then you say that you, didn't, you choose not to have kids, but you do have a bunch of kids in here. Oh, yeah. You're a father of so many of those guys. Jerry's kids. And you have so many guys that you are you're kind of responsible, or, or, or I mean, not with that much, but they all... They're all here because of you and you. I mean, so they, no matter why. I don't. I mean, but Tom will tell you, some can learn and some can't too. It's it's all there for all of them. Some of them will learn it. I'm very proud of at least three guys. Another guy, that I'm I'm totally going to say never going to work for them. They'll never learn it. You you had to be around jujitsu guys. This guy's a phenom. 
And that guy can't even know what an arm bar is. He'd been here three years, can't arm bar, you know what I'm saying? So that's just the way it goes. But you know what would kill you was, if you had a guy that was a phenom, and he still couldn't arm bar you. You're going, this kid is not even using his potential. And that's what disturbs me. It disturbs me about anything. You know, in, in, in anything in life, it just disturbs me. What are the things that excite you when someone comes in the door? Or Progress. Comes in? My, my gym is based on the chalkboard. Get on that chalkboard. I, I get on time all the time. You know, when you go to me, I want them numbers. Because mm-hmm. that numbers, I mean, that number is another sort of door. You know, you come up, oh, what the hell, this man's got axes outside. I ain't going to that house. He's got, now he's got 10 more racks outside. I ain't going to ask for sure. The more, the, every time you break a record, it's harder to get in the gym, and the gym's stronger. And that's how it's done. It's, it's all the world's stats. You know, 80 guys over eight in the, in the squad, about eight, uh, 80 in the bench, so over six, something like that. It's 80 in 2,000. No one's got stats like that. And that's the bottom of the line. We don't even talk about that crap. And a, a big thing, I think, you're, you're fucking terrible with names, but numbers. You can, this guy will come in, hasn't been here for three years, he's got no idea who his name is, but he remembers Max Effort, he remembers what he got. And that's one thing I've noticed with you, you, you recite numbers as if it happened yesterday, and they are so important. And it took me a while to, I'm like, why the fuck, but, because numbers never lie. And it's so important to have all these numbers right, but, were you always like that? Like from, like numbers was just... Numbers is stuck in my head, but when I almost died in 91, the second time, it got really stuck in my head. It took a year to recover. I had to quit work. I was crane operator. I wasn't capable of running the crane. And then it all stuck in my head. Everything's math. Don't know why. Simple math, but math. And you know the ones in the gym that's not good with numbers, and you know they're the worst ones, aren't you? You know who we're talking about. No, I have a record on this. I don't have a record on it. Well, you've been here 12 years. How could you not have a record on this stuff? You know, what do you say? Got any more stuff? Can you name it? Did I, I would bad memory, but can you name it the ten most important athletes at Westside Barbell? That it has to be on the list of Westside Barbell. You mean lifters? The lifters, the athletes for barbell. Well, the lifters. listen, the ten top ones that I, you have to be. This guy, it is a barbell. Uh, <coughs> Dave Hoff would be number one because he's the strongest one in my club. And I mean, Dave, you know, he's got the two top totals, and then, um, and then um, it would be like AJ because he's got he had the fourth. I mean, these are top ten totals in the world, one and two, four, nine and ten, and and then um, it would be um, Shane Hammond, and um, uh, you know, uh, Jake. Jake, and then Chuck had to, it was his top two seventy five. You know, numbers go because the gears go. Chuck Vogelpool, I mean, and as far as lifting, and then um, I mean, I forgot Joe McCoy. Kenny Patterson, George Howard, there's so many, 10 wasn't done. You know, they were the ones they made the gym. And when they, and they, they know the rule, like the Rock said, know your rule, Jaboni. Their, their role was to make the gym, and they did it. And they enjoyed it. But like I said, they all, they all just, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm like a punch truck fighter. You know, I, I just go, I, you know, you see guys, there's fighters I'm not going to talk about, because I would never tell them to quit. But they should quit fighting, maybe, but I would never tell them. Because in their brain, they can't quit. And, I, and I, I'm not going to mention because I got great respect for people like that. Even they get their ass kicked. They ain't scared to get their ass kicked. Any old power lifters listening to this, I, I know you can understand what I'm going to say. I probably seen 40 gyms disappear, and we're still here. I mean, you know, great gyms, Black Health World, uh, you know, Big Iron. Uh, Big Iron. I mean, uh, the Grimwood system. There's a million gyms. And there's gyms that aren't gyms that not even there anyhow, but they think they're there. And but we're still here, and we're not planning to go anywhere. As long as I've got I've got three people in my gym right now, I believe have potential to break world records. As long as I believe they got potential, I'm hanging in there. I'm gonna hang in with them, try to get world records. Because that's something I never had. I was uh, 17 and seven off world record, and that it, anyone can break a world. We're the greatest in the world at that point of all time. Do you think if you got a sprinter that you can make a sprinter the fastest guy in the world? Do you think that's... What do you think, John? <laughs> yeah. We think we can if we can get one here. And that's... Because then you'd have the strongest and the fastest. Yeah. And I want the most explosive going to the highest box jump. We got 63 and a half, and this is by an intern. Bring me an athlete in here, and we'll get a 70-some inch box jump. That's that's what I said. I've always got goals. I've got goals. My goals aren't done. 
And I, you know what? You can't live in that. You know what I am? Look at me. What am I? A broken old man. But but I know what I am. And a lot of people don't know what they are. A lot you're, of you're living in the past. That's what I'm saying. So You accept who you are. A lot of people don't want to accept who they are. Yeah, you know, one thing, though, I watched this, this wildlife film and this big-ass moose is out there in the, in the woods. He sees a grizzly bear coming. It's an old moose. And I watched that moose. He just said, hell with it. I'm not going nowhere. He got in a fight and the grizzly killed him. And that's me. I'm not going to run. I'm too late. It's too, I can't run. It's too late. I'll stand my ground. You know? How, how much um, influence and importance were books like Johnson, Livingston, Siegel, um, The Book of the Five Rings, all, like, and uh, even The Call of the Wild? All these books had significant um, impact on you and your training. Yeah, it had tremendous impact. Uh, the Jonathan Livingston Seagull, simple little, I guess you call it a spiritual book. Um, you know, he was a seagull wanted to fly real fast, and of course he got kicked out of the flock because he weren't supposed to. And then he thought he was the world's fastest goal. I think he'd fly 190 or something. And he's on the beach one time, he's, he saw this uh, silver gull that he had on the beach. And then all of a sudden the gull was sitting next to him and said, how did you do that? And the gull goes, perfect speed. And he said, what's that? And he said, perfect speed's being there. And it took my total from 1555 in November of 72 to 1655 of February 73 by thinking of that concept, perfect speed is being there. Like, you know, if you throw that perfect punch, perfect speed, the man's knocked out. You see it on... You see an armbar a hundred times over, you get it, right? You right. see a choke. I That's how I think when I lift, it's perfect speed. There's no struggle. Like, you know, I'm sure when you fight, it's not a fight. It's, it's. I don't know what it is. When I lift it, when I strain, it's not a strain. It's something else. It's an outer body experience. And then uh, the call of the wild. You know, when Buck, he gets lost out in the woods and he's, he hooks up with a bunch of wolves and he watched a wolf get in a fight, you know, trying to be the pack leader and he got down and everyone jumped on and killed him and said, that, well, if you get down, They'll all jump on you. Is that not society today? And so it always, you know, and then, uh, and this is why this book really inspired me because then when Book was rescued and he got back on the farm, he was taking, he's a lazy ass big dog now, and a, and a big bitch of a dog runs across the yard and knocked him on his ass. And then he, he remembered what would have happened if he'd been up there. So you always want to be around danger. You know, I always still go down to the worst part of Columbus because I like to be around danger. If you think you're safe, that's when you're not. You know what? It's always the little guy that's going to get you. It's not the biggest guy. So you just, you just, you got to look like that. Um, and what was the third book? The Five Rings. I mean, Mashashi. Uh, I, I, I mean, no, I'm not I'm a samurai, but I like to try to think I'm a mini, mini samurai how I live. Like I said, just go out and blaze the glory. Samurais never worry about getting killed. They only worry about killing. So that's how you got to live. You want to, you know, you, Set your mind to accomplish it, not get cut. Oh, I'm afraid I might get cut. Well, how do you know? You might not get cut, you know? I wouldn't nothing that even like... Remember what I told you in Cincinnati? You know, you like what I said, because he's telling these guys that you got a minute to choke me out. we got a contest. And I says, no, Carter, i got a minute to choke I you out. That. Yes. That's, that's a, what that a samurai definite, thinks. That's a definite change of pattern. When you know that you're going to, you know, the way that you see the things. You know, you didn't see that you need to survive with me a minute. You, you see that you need to beat me in a minute, even if that was a, a big, long distance, but that was your goal, not survival. So it's just winning. You got me over in the scrap house one day, probably, what, 30 seconds, rolled me around circles, finally got me. Well, I won for 30 seconds. And yes. See, I didn't lose that day completely. I won for 30 seconds. Yes. If I make it 35, I won for 30. That's how my brain, my brain thinks everything's get, gauged towards success and going forward not backwards and too many people are just stymied they're stymied they can't no social growth I guess I think a big thing you have um, again you read the book of the five rings you listen to you you see the similarities but one of the rules is never stray from the way in that book and you have a certain set of rules that you live and die by and no matter who or what because we got these guys who go to a meet don't tell us and then you're like, I gotta go to the meet. Even though you don't have to, it's your set of rules. And you're breaking your own rules. Not not just to please them, but you gotta stick to your rules. And no matter what, you stick to your guns. And I think a lot of people can't do that. They flexible rules or they break them, but you don't, you stick to them. That's I mean, you got, you got it, you, you can't, like, you know, you gotta follow what Tom said, you gotta follow the path. You know, I've got one path, it's a narrow one. 
and I, I, my life's pretty boring to people, or there's only a few things I watch, but I get super inspired by these few things. So I don't need a lot of things. Tommy, one day, we're making, we're messing around. I was talking to Matt, trying to, I really want to try to psych him up, but AJ, you know, we had the fighters out there, and I said, you know, people come, I don't know their names. I mean, Tommy knows how bad I am. And I hate to say this, or I don't know dates, because I don't give a damn. Because if it's not important, I don't care. So why would I let my mind get filled with unimportant things? I'm only going to let two or three very important things fill my mind. Does this make sense? So I, t I was telling the guys down there that they're not important. I don't know their name, and I don't care. I don't. So AJ says, I'll show him. Says that he won't forget my name. So then the next day, AJ's in the parking lot. Well, you know, you know AJ with the fighters. And I walked up and said, what's your name again? And he goes, AJ. And I started laughing at him. <laughs> but you know that's I thought that was a good joke just to mess with him but that's I honestly don't how many people come here I don't know what was, that, what was that damn kid from Ohio State what was his name the, the gymnast I don't even know his name all I know is the city of the gymnast Ohio State always, but you know don't complicate your mind with things that don't matter and only, only one thing matters how can I or how can I make someone better? And you, you see it, Tommy. A lot of sometimes you're jealousy in the gym, and it kills these guys. You, work, we see it right now. <laughs> and how you do with them mentally? I mean, you, I know you can train them physically; they all can be strong. But how can you be strong mentally? How I've always said them? I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a power lifter. Uh, you know, some people, uh, like I don't care. Like I said, I'm not wasting my time on the dead. There, some of these people are dead in the head, and I, I'm just. That's why you can tell, like. You know, if I brush you off, you know, hey, fuck a million, man. He must not like me very well because I'm not going to waste my time with you because I'm not. I mean, I wouldn't waste my time with you because it's, it's, why would I waste my time? Because there's some people we're wasting our time with. So, it, like, if you two, if you're, if you're as crap, I mean, really, you know, let's face it, and he's got all, why would I give you, after a while, I'm going, like, this kid's going nowhere. Why do, why give him, one, you go, but I go, why would I take my, why would I waste, Two hours a day on him, going nowhere. Why not put the two hours on him? Because he's going to be the star. And it's, it's, it's the gym is the thing. You know, we did a thing, who built Westside? Many people think they built Westside. There's a hundred people who built Westside. Not one. Not one. Not me. Not not Kenny. Not AJ. We all combined. What what good is that? I'm going to match that. None. you got, you got to make a fist. A finger just means point. This means business. Right? You make a fist, you could get somewhere. And my gym is a gigantic fist. Do you think they a lot of they changed the idea between Louis as a friend and Louis as a trainer? Because a lot of times they mistake that between the line between you as a friend and you as a trainer. Well, I don't get too friendly with anyone in the gym. <clears throat> not really, do I? Uh, the, the gym is the gym. The gym's a gym. It's training, and they might not like what I got to say. I tell them, and after, I mean, if they don't listen, that's well, I'm okay. I don't care. In my th my third year here, I remember this kid come up to you, and uh, he's been trained there for a while. I think I don't know who brought him in, and he walks up to Lou, and he, he he did average weight, and he goes, Lou, I got a question for you. And he's like, What is it? Do you think I have any potential in this sport? He goes, No. He goes, No, really. He goes, I'm being serious. No, straight like that. And the the guy never had, but that's the problem nowadays. No one has been realistic. They're so afraid to dash someone's dream. But this kid had he was average, but. You could see his whole life is just boom, over. But that's the gym. You can't take that personal. It's the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. But that's what the gym's about. P people, many people would ask me, do you think I'd be strong? And I go, no, never. And I said, you know what? I love basketball, but I would play in the NBA. Five foot five. I, I got in a sport that I could excel at. You know, I knew. Do you still remember, like, that moment where, or what it was where you... You know, you played baseball. You were good. You, you know, what was it where you you came back from? I was a very good baseball player. I played on a farm club for the Pittsburgh Steelers at 15, but you had to be 17, mm -hmm. out of school. And I started and I started left field and and uh, bat uh, and uh, batted uh, third third. I mean, I was a tremendous baseball player, but when I when I got uh, out of high school, got in the army, you know, going in the army. I'm thinking to myself, hey, and this is why I tell people what I think. I'm saying I'm not big enough to be a professional baseball player, even in 1966. I mean, five foot five. Mm -hmm. What you know? I'm, but I mean, all that money. But I, I was not going to make it anyhow. Why not be something? Um, why not lift a weight class to something I could excel at? And I love to be strong. I wanted to be strong. I mean, I would have loved to fight if there's people to teach me how to fight. But see, back then that wasn't going on up here. Maybe Brazil, yeah. Here, no. And uh, there wasn't organized anything about uh, combat 
Or not even bop, one boxy place. <coughs> Sun, sunshine down here. And I live three miles out in the country and have a car. So, you know, I, I pick what I could be good at and then dedicate my life to it. I mean, it's just not my life either. I dedicate my life to a lot of people, at least a lot of time. And that's why, I'm going to tell you, man, and, and we tell them what's going to happen. I've told people what's going to happen to them, and it exactly happened to them. And I don't want to say, well, you told me so, Lou. But you know what? Jesus Christ, can you just listen? I've, been, I've done this, seen this. I a guy was telling us what to do with a heavyweight, one of our heavyweights. And I said, I'm going to tell you something, dude. I said, he's your guinea pig. I've had 100 hogs. And finally, when he turned our way, things took off. I mean, you know, I've been through this. Mm. Yeah. Now, I don't know. Like, I, that's what I changed, though. I realized then that I was not going to be a professional baseball player. I love sports. I also realized, too, when I, I got enormously strong real fast. And, you know, and when I did, I had to almost give up sports. Because I got in quite a few fights, and I would grab guys and jerk them to the ground. I just jerk them to the ground, and grab on their arm like a wrist, and just jerk them from my side, and jerk them right to the damn ground. And then I started realizing I'm hurting my biceps. I mean, I'm hurting myself more than they're hurting me. <laughs> I just was back. You know, if no one knew how to, if you didn't know how to fight, I'm 175, bench 450, deadlift 670, at 180, and squat at 630 with no gear. I'd maul your ass if you didn't know how to fight. I'd maul you. I did it. You know, but then when you learn how to fight, and that's why I love fighting, um, because it's so technical. I mean, we know jujitsu, boxing and jujitsu is so technical. It takes years. Boxing just to learn foot. If you can't learn the feet, you, you can't be a fighter. And uh, you know, now when I got in, I'm forty something years old and had six pro boxers, and that's when I got in. Hey, you you got to get in here. Like, they're giving me a leather shampoo like I never seen, and I'm going, I can't even hit some of these damn guys. You know, never been in a fight my, in my life. I couldn't hit someone. And then I'm going like, damn, man, I see this on TV. It looks so simple until you're in there. That is true. It looks it's real true. simple. For sure. Or, or like it, it's lifting to do. Sometimes you see a guy doing a, a 600 bench press here. He can do it. And then you're like, it can't be that hard. It was like, it's it just. Yeah, it just takes a long it's time. It's way worse than what you're looking at. You yeah. Know? Well, like jiu-jitsu, you know, I'm learning just enough about in MMA fights watching. I mean, you see, you can see what's going to happen. You see him slipping over for the choker, or and it's and I admire this, and the crowd's booing because <laughs> they're not hitting each other's own. But I don't care where the fight goes. I'm an MMA fan. I'm a, I'm a fan of all martial arts. So wherever the fight goes, you know, from stand up to clinch to ground or whatever, I'm all for. It. And now you have a bunch of MMA fighters training here, and then yeah. jujitsu guys like myself yeah. and some other guys. And, and, I, mean, and I see how hard they train. Totally different. It's a different. You can, it's a different direction. Yeah, the program with Tom is just um, you know some pros and amateurs. I mean, mm -hmm. both of them. And you guys are open for more and more and more and having all the sports like in the beginning he's mentioned MMA, but and then even though I see boxers, uh, jiu jitsu, MMA guys, wrestling, they all different martial arts, but they they take it the same. Uh, they drink at the same water and get strong. Two ways to train. Train correctly or train incorrectly and it's up to the coach I think that the problem is not the system the problem is the coach the coach can't adapt the system for the sport and that's where they fuck up and that's it they just don't they don't have the they can't take the information they can't process it correctly and they can't put it into the sport well how many people you know like a good stand up but they'll never lose jujitsu there's a lot of people like that. Or they just can't. I mean, and that's just the way some people are. So well, you they come, don't like it. But unfortunately, they're coaches, and we see it. So we you know, we try to help coaches because we're never going to help the athletes. You know, uh, So we have to help the, try to help the coaches, and I'm all for it. I, we don't, how much do we charge? Tom? I don't charge a damn yeah. penny. Someone asked me one time, says, how come you don't charge? I said, well, if I charge, I have to let any idiot in here, and I'm not doing it. And I've had people come here, and my guy said, don't ever bring that man back here or he's getting his ass kicked. So I could never bring him back. I don't think none of my guys would do that now, but boy, some guys don't ever bring that guy in. But I've been a lot of guys, like I, I told you, uh, like like Rob. I'd love to have Rob come because you don't know what's going to happen to Rob. You go in and get a push or you come in and grab me in. It, may, it makes my life a, leave a little bit alive. <laughs> Thinking I may be, you know, mauled today. I love coming. Instead of walk around, you know, it's not like I told you, that's why I go down in the bottoms. Go down there, hey. What's up? I remember. Uh, but that's, you know, you want to stay alive. Sure. I walked out of the gym. You were fine. Rob was fine. Rob went in and goes, what's up, Rob? Tom goes up, walks in. Five minutes later, 
Rob comes out, he's got scratch marks on his face. <laughs> he's about to get a photo shoot, it's a family portrait, and the first one he's going to get done or something. Luke comes out with his nose bloody. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Don't laugh. It happened. I got him in the mouth one time, cut my finger, but then he really laid into me. He punched uh, him in the bicep. Remember that? You, he's like, that hurt. He goes, no shit. Oh. You punch him in the arm. You ever spar with him? No. Can't pop a camera. Every time he likes to throw a couple jabs and slip over and throw a hook. And I know. So he threw them two jabs, and when he started to step over, I, I threw, I wanted to hit him in the jaw and cut him on the bicep. He's complaining at the time. I said, Jesus Christ, he's 100 years old. <laughs> but I love, Rob is, Rob, Rob is crazy. Yeah, yeah. I love, I, mean, I love Rob. He's a, he's a very, uh, Flag, West Side flag. He's just a, he's a, he's a. No way. Very, he, he speaks the truth. He don't like it. He's gonna let you know. Dorian, yes. Dorian he's Price, very, one of the guys that flag, you know. So, yeah. yeah. I got Dorian Price. I got Tommy. I got Matt, Matt Brown, and I got him in my house watching pay per view fights. I'm thinking this is gonna break into a fist fight for this. <laughs> the Matt's house, the old house. No, it's at his house. house. At his house. That was the he first gets, and last time he got. He gets so upset. He gets so upset about this. Something you know, I'm going, God oh, damn, Rob, this is the best thing I can do. <laughs> this is Westside Barbell with strength and conditioning legend Louis Simmons. WestsideBarbell.com, the strongest website in the world.